Good morning. My name is Susan Reardon. I'm the staff hearing officer, and I call the meeting of Wednesday, January 20th to order. Today we have four items on the agenda, including a consent item, and I haven't received any requests for continuances or withdrawals or postponements, so we'll hear them in the order that they appear on the agenda. Under announcements and appeals, I would like to announce that last Thursday, January 14th, there was an appeal of a staff hearing officer denial of a medical marijuana dispensary permit that was proposed at 2609 De La Vina Street. And um, the Planning Commission upheld the decision of the staff hearing officer and denied the appeal without prejudice. Um, so I just wanted to announce that. Um, and then we also received another appeal of a staff hearing officer decision of a denial of a front setback modification to allow parking within the front yard. Um, that decision was made on January 6th of this year, and we have received an appeal for that item, and a planning commission hearing date hasn't been set yet, so once one is set, I will announce it. Is there anyone here in the audience who would like to address the staff hearing officer on items not on today's agenda? Seeing no one, I'll go to the consent item, which is a request for a two-year time extension of an expiration of a tentative map that was approved by the staff hearing officer back in November um, of 2011 for a property located at 127 West Kenner Perdido Street. And typically I waive the staff report on this type of item. It is a request for a time extension. And I see the case planner in the audience. Is there anything you want to add above the? And I don't see the applicant, so I assume they don't have anything to add on the item. I have reviewed the staff report and the justifications um, for requesting the time extension, and I agree with staff's recommendation that the project still um, is in conformance with our general plan and our zoning ordinance, and we haven't made any significant changes to either of those documents that would affect the project's consistency uh, with those documents. So I grant the um, request for the two-year time extension, and the new uh, expiration date is now November 16, 2017. So we'll go to the first item on the regular agenda, which is 20, uh, 1425 Mission Ridge Road, if the applicant would like to come up. Good morning. <laughs> Smiley, you're on candy camera. <laughs> okay. Joanne McConty, assistant planner. Um, this property is at 1425 Mission Ridge Road, and it's a 1.92 acre site. It's zoned A2, and it's a with approximately 22% slope, and it's in the Hillside Design District. The current development on site consists of a 3,374 square foot single family residence and an attached 526 square foot two car garage. The proposed project involves demolition of the existing single family dwelling and garage and construction of a new single family residence, uh, two level, consisting of a 4,390 square foot main level, a 3,660 square foot basement, a 550 square foot attached two car garage, a 704 square foot detached three car garage, a 480 square foot detached accessory structure. It also includes a new swimming pool, terraces, landscaping, and grading. The proposed total of 9,784 square feet, of which approximately 7,960 7 square feet applies to the Florida lot area ratio, is 145% of the maximum guideline Florida lot area ratio. The proposal requires a determination of substantial conformance uh, with a staff hearing officer approval of October of 2008 
and will abate violations in the 2015 zoning information report. The request before you today or a modification to allow the total garage floor area to exceed the maximum allowable size of 750 square feet, and a modification to allow this detached accessory structure to be located in a front yard. A little background for the project. In 2008, the staff hearing officer approved a modification for over height walls of the property. That project also included a, an amendment to a prior project approved by the Planning Commission in 2006 for as-built walls and grading at the front of the property and within the road right of way and for removal of an as-built pool, as-built removal of a pool and more landscaping plans. And that um, project was approved with conditions in 2006 by the Planning Commission. Um, the project was then withdrawn and replaced uh, with the show project of 2008, and that show project was approved subject to conditions. One of the conditions, uh, which was carried over from the Planning Commission approval, was that a uh, future house would be a one, uh, let me just say it correctly, that any future house would be um, a single story house in the Mediterranean architectural style it would be subject to approval by the single family design board and it would need to maintain the view corridor from Franceschi Park. So as part of the previous um, approval by the Planning Commission, was, which was for removal of landscaping in the right of way, it created a view corridor for um, Franceschi Park and then when the Planning Commission reviewed it, since it was created by removal of landscaping, they felt that that view corridor should be maintained. So that um, project condition was, was included in the 2008 staff hearing officer approval. And so staff is requesting um, some input from the staff hearing officer regarding that substantial conformance request. Uh, also, the proposal will address zoning violations and as and a zoning information report from 2015. Therefore, a condition has been included to that effect. Um, the first uh, thing I'd like to talk about is the oversized garage. So the zoning ordinance in the A2 zone allows for 750 square feet of garage area maximum on the site or covered parking. Um, the application is requesting more as they're proposing a three-car garage with 704 square feet and a two-car garage that's approximately um, 550 square feet, so it will be over the maximum of 750 by approximately 504 square feet. Because the proposal is for greater than 750 square feet of uh, parking, covered parking, it requires the modification. Staff uh, is in support of the modification because this lot is large for the A2 zone at 1.92 acres. And normally for an A2 zone newly created today, you would require 25,000 square feet of lot area. However, with a slope of 20% greater than 20%, in this case, it would be 50,000 square feet. So this uh, lot is substantially larger than that. And the lot, um, the covered parking will allow for, to enclose the, the property owner is a vehicle collection and not have the storage outside, outside of the remaining set, setback. And it's not anticipated to adversely impact the adjacent neighbors or the visual openness of the street frontage because as you look from Mission Ridge Road, it, it, uh, the property it goes down and um, it's not very visible. So that is why staff is supporting the request for the covered parking. Uh, transportation has reviewed the project and stated that the garages will function as proposed. The zoning ordinance also allows for a maximum of 500 square feet of detached accessory space other than the garages. So this uh, accessory space is proposed to be 480 square feet. Although um, it's out of the required front setback, it's the remaining front yard. and. The zoning ordinance doesn't allow for structures other than garages to be in the front yard. So therefore, the applicant is requesting a modification to allow the um, detached accessory space in the remaining front yard. Um, staff does not support this request because the entire house and garage are proposed to be demolished and it appears that they could have designed the project to make a conforming option for the detached accessory space. However, it should be noted that there are site constraints, especially along this side and at the back with us due to the 
slope of the property. Um, some, the proposal, because of the construction of this structure in a location that's close proximity to an oak tree, staff would normally have required an arborist report as part of the environmental review for construction in close proximity to that oak tree. Um, but because staff is recommending denial of that modification, we didn't request it at this time. However, should the staff hearing officer decide to approve the accessory structure in the front yard, staff is re recommending a condition that an arborist report shall be obtained by a certified arborist and um, any recommendations for implementation for protection measures for that oak tree would be implemented as part of that proposal. Therefore, a condition has been included to that effect. Uh, the proposal also includes removal of a, of a fruit tree in this location and the front setback. And so staff has added a condition that if required that, uh, by Parks and Recreation that the applicant shall obtain a permit for the removal of the front setback tree. Um, and if it's not required, then they would not have to do it. Um, the other thing is there is a proposal for an access path to a hobby shop with eight and a half foot wide doors. And that could possibly be used as a garage, although the applicant has stated that's not their intention. So staff has added a condition that the hobby shop should not be used as a garage space. Um, the project was reviewed by the single family design board and was forwarded to the staff hearing officer with comments. Staff recommends that the staff hearing officer approve the garage size modification and deny the accessory building modification subject to the findings and conditions outlined in the staff report. And that concludes staff's presentation. Okay. Um, All right, um, I don't have any questions yet. Uh, would you like to state your name for the record and provide additional comments? Yes, my name is Tom Oxner, Project Architect. I'm here with the owner, Russell Steiner. I am Russell Steiner, the owner. Okay. Um, I have a set of drawings that has, that has some additional graphics in it that have addressed some of the, the um, items that have come up in the staff report. <coughs> May we refer to this? Yeah, we'll want to keep them. Okay, you got it. So what I'd like to do is I'm, I'm going to just go through and point out some elements to each one of the, uh, the two mods and the substantial conformity finding. Um, so what I'd like to do is just sort of start with the, the basics of the two mods. Um, this property here wouldn't need these mods if it met the, the um, performance standard. The performance standard in this case can't be met because we're 2% over the slope at 22%. And we're, and then even with that, with if you apply that two by multiplier to the minimum lot size, we only miss it by 16%. So, the point is, is that this property really is wanting to act like a bigger property, and it, it's kind of the perfect storm when it comes to the inability to make that finding. And if it, it and th that the performance standard wouldn't necessarily give us a second risk. It would, but we're not. We're only looking for it in the sense that to get more garage space and to um, um, have some flexibility on the accessory structure in the front yard. So excuse me, can I interrupt you? So the performance mm -hmm. standard you're talking about is if you're going to add a second unit versus accessory space in the front yard, because that's a requirement regardless of your lot size as well as the size of your... But it could be considered a second, a, a second residence and therefore it could be located in the front yard. Okay, that's how you're getting that that way. We, right, okay. that's kind of the logic. Okay. As well as the garage size, we would have two times the 750, and what we're proposing here is even less than that. Okay. So, so that was the performance standard that you were getting at, not the subject mod you're asking exactly. for. It's what that you could have, you feel you could have asked for. Right, so, okay. so um, you know, if, if you take this property, and just to, to apply it, there are a lot of other properties that meet the performance standard that are obviously much less in size than this one. You could take this property and cut it in half, put homes on each one, it would still have an FAR less than most of the properties around it. In fact, the proposed project here at, at its current FAR is being proposed of the nearest 21 homes. It's, it's the bottom, it's the lowest 4% of the, of the homes around it. Um, so it's, it's an anomaly. It, it, it really wants to um, uh, grab onto and use some of the um, elements that properties that do meet that performance standard 
um, rely upon. For example, I, I presume one of the reasons for not allowing an, ac an accessory structure in the front yard is to retain the single family nature of a neighborhood and not have it look like duplexes or other structures. And this is clearly lays out as an estate type of a property that really is different, um, I think, and maybe not in the spirit of, um, of how it's being applied in this particular case. But let's, let me go through and just kind of um, um, go through our logic in terms of the siting of the home, which I think is um, indicative of why we end up with the need to have an accessory structure in the front yard. Um, the current house right now, which is coming down, is located, we feel, in an ideal spot. It was built there. It, it was built over a large understory, which we want to use, um, as you can see in this photo, um, to take advantage of that depression and incorporate that into the grading for the main residence. It also allows for um, an easterly daylighting of the basement, which um, adds some natural light. And it also allows for some accessibility to the shop down below and hobby space, to, as well as the mechanical equipment down there for the boilers, for the radiant heating, and, and the solar voltaic equipment, and so forth. So the access that we're looking for is already a part of the existing topography of the site. Um, there is, um, you can see on that east side, there's, this is the area below there. And we would be utilizing that grade for that shop area under the house. So we basically putting the, the proposed house over the existing house, there's some advantages with regard to not only saving in terms of grading, but really in terms of good site design. Um, the other element of locating the house there is that we have this condition of one story. So in, in order to maximize the site, utilizing the understory in this way puts more of an emphasis on, because we don't have the ability to really go higher. And I'll get more into the, um, the finding and how we really feel we've met that substantial conformity finding. Um, let's see, let's go. So these photos here, I just want to sort of go through these. The, these illustrate the location of the proposed accessory structure. The reason we've got it located where it is is um, specifically located where it is is because we, because Mission Ridge Road is higher up here and it, and it goes down. Putting it right here affords us the ability to really hide it from uh, the public road. I have a section. Let's see back here. So, here. so this this gives you an idea of at this location how that tucks the accessory structure below Mission Ridge and further um, retains the spirit of wanting to maintain the view across the site. Um, if we, so putting it close to that, oh, if we put it just kind of strategically close enough to where we feel we're not going to interfere with the health of that oak tree, and of course, if it needs to slide slightly west, if we get to the point where we need an arborist report, we'll, we'll look at that. So in... In a, in a case like this, you know, this is a small player in the, in the piece of this entire property. If, if we're not afforded the ability to put the accessory structure in the front yard, it's going to have no effect on the location of the house. We still want to propose the house where it is. We feel that's I, ideal. SFDB looked at the project. They had no concerns or questions as to why the house was sited where it was. It seemed pretty obvious and good site planning. They did make the comment that, um, that this location of the accessory structure is certainly preferable to its alternative location down here on the hill, um, in which case there would be significant grading and it would be visible from public views, whereas right here, you're not even going to know it's there. And it really, it will add no um, uh, significant effect uh, to the neighborhood. And why can't it be located in association with the residents? In a, um, well, the idea of this meditation. is to get... This is a big property, and it, it, to spread out some of the spaces makes sense. It's part of the character of an estate quality property. To, and a use such as a meditation room yoga, the whole idea of getting away from the house and separating yourself is, is a big part of the, of the, of the um, mindset. The neighbors have weighed in, and they've looked at what we want to do. Nobody has any concerns in yellow, we've actually received letters of support from the... And I think they're included in there. Yeah, they are included yeah. in there. Um, so let's just then talk a little bit about the um, hobby shop down below. I know there was some comments on that. But, and I think Russell's got um, a good handle on what more specifically his ideas are on this. So basically, 
some kind of access down here is, is really would be great. There's heavy equipment, and ultimately it, it's going to be part of the mechanical of the house. So the ability to get down there is of value. Um, and this is, Russell, you want to kind of go through well, I can chime in on this if you yeah. want. Um, I'm very mechanical. I like building things and designing stuff. And I have quite a bit of tools. An example, these are just the picture of one wall of my present small garage with a whole wall with tools. And example, that box right there weighs about 600 pounds because of all tools. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, and this one's about 300 pounds. And there's uh, more pictures of my equipment mm -hmm. and things <laughs> for your record. Um, yeah, I, I don't think that was really a, dis, um, a concern of yeah. staff. They were just talking about the door and just um, at, a, at a later date, if it starts turning into another garage, that becomes a concern because that's additional garage space on the lot, which um, it, it's against yeah, it's, our zone right. thing. So I don't think they had a concern with that. Um, it was more the accessory space and then wanted mm -hmm. input on the substantial conformance determination. Okay. So... Um, well, there's if no attention in condition regarding it can't be converted to a garage. Yeah. I think then the that's that fine. Yeah. Not an issue. That's fine. Okay. Well, great then. Let's just look at the substantial conformity. That um, would be good because I would like you to focus on um, how I know it says one story mm -hmm. and to protect the view corridor from Franceschi Park. So how is that? How is your plan doing that? Um, because it does look like it's getting taller and broader. Okay. So, so let's do that. I, it, I have this here. Really? Uh, this. There it is. Okay, so. so but you need to somehow get on the mic. Um, Two months. Okay, I will do it. And then is this. Yes, this. Oh, here's the pointer. This will work basically. Right, I need to see if there's a, a map here. I, okay, so I don't see the uh, the map. But I have a map. Um, a site plan that kind of, I would oh, like to oh, describe kind of where these are from. So, okay, so what we've done is we've built, um, we've got what's called a, um, a point uh, survey of the existing property. So basically, it creates pixels of the existing house, and it's on a it, it's in a three D model. So we've done what we've done is then we've we've superimposed on top of that accurate story poles of the configuration of the proposed roof line, and we've taken um, four vantage points from. Uh, let's see a map here. So what we've done is we've looked at um, here. Right across these arrows right here show where these um, points of vantage points are taken from uh, the trail up on Franceschi and at, and at um, sequential locations along Mission Ridge. The intent here, we, we believe, is to maintain the public view over the top of the house to the ocean below and, and, and to the city below for not only people using Mission Ridge but also from the park. So if you look at these images here, you can see that that the the low slung house is this darker area, and then these lines represent the actual ridges of the proposed house. What we noticed is that is that the um, to the east, if you're looking out to the east, it's not as um, a dramatic and accessible view as the houses from the directly south to the to the west. So the the higher portions. Have kind of have, have have been applied to a little bit over in this area, and then just the one element protruding up slightly from um, the visual, looking straight out, and then we've kept it very low here. So we feel the one-story house is 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 very similar. The proposed one-story house, we're calling it one-story. Technically, it's two-story because the understory daylights, and really, in, in by definition, it's it's a two-story house, but. Because it's a one-story height above the grade that exists out there, we feel it's in compliance, and it maintains the essence of the view that runs across um, from the current um, vantage point now. So we feel it's in, in, in com conformance with the spirit of that, of that requirement. So is this the garage, or is this the house part? That's the detached garage. It's what What's this area here on the garage? It looks like it's a, or I mean on the site plan, it looks like it's a rectangle. Yeah. And that, then here, it, here is this line, and on yeah, the site the, plan, it looks like it's closer to the. This was done earlier when we had to reduce the size of the garage to um, 
for a number of reasons, but I believe what you're seeing off the end there is a is a portion of the garage that was taken off. Um, this it's not in this. Here's the um, here's this is right here. So it looks like it's been pushed over more. Okay, the detached garage and the rest have been altered a little bit. Let's see here. Okay, so that does not. Yeah. Okay, I see what's going on. Yeah, the detached garage isn't on there. We pulled the detached, but I, it was determined that that that, that wasn't really um, a sensitive area looking through the site, and that was our. If, if you look at the location, if you look at these images across across this the here's view. from the plant the planning commission staff report when mm -hmm. um, I was talking about view quarters and stuff. Um, and on the site plan, it shows this area, and it's about the, you know, this says 19 existing houses, mm -hmm. 19 feet, and um, it was giving examples of a potential future structure within at 21 and coming over, but it's still kept open. Yeah, so, this area. so, so, so I think it height, is the city and the ocean view that was important. We we've honored that height, so our 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 points don't ex really. I mean, very slightly there, but we don't have anything really that's significantly above that line. In terms of, uh, if you look in these photos, if you, if you look to the to the west, the oaks are in the way. You really can't see much. Um, you know that that was a little bit ago, but I think that. Um, you know the the garages are are clearly a one-story structure. They're not the highest structures on you know, that that we're proposing. And that you know, in looking at it from the site, we didn't see that that was a real sensitive. And what's the theory. height of the garage? Okay. I, I know the house is about twenty-two and a half feet. The, in yeah, this garage is in the neighborhood of fifteen feet. Um, so here, this is indicating the house at here. twenty-two. So this is, yep. So this right here, you can see. I have a, you have a scale oh yeah, scale. that's great. Perfect. So the height from grade is fourteen feet ish. Okay. So it's 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 a low structure relative to the to the house and mm -hmm. and, and it's and it's pulled forward. Um, but again, I in you know, I spent a lot of time up there looking through here and the location of this garage, if you see it's pulled forward and it's you know it's not going to have much effect at all from really it's the ridge line of the existing house you know and you know there it, it appears you can see from the edge of the, the house that's coming down to the proposed edge it stretches out but that area is it's a very low um, part of the residence mm -hmm. really the dramatic I mean looking over the house and seeing the, the views of the ocean beyond it is, mm -hmm. I think, the spirit of what, what was requested there. Um, and then the other thing from the previous um, project in regards, oh, this shows it too, in regards to the substantial, well, sorry, the top, <laughs> substantial sorry. conformance request um, is, uh, it was regarding all the, the grading that happened, the overheight walls and that, um, was the preserva preservation of trees. Mm -hmm. And this oak tree was shown as remaining, but it's gone now. I mean, when you look at the current aerial, um, and I, I think this is around the construction when this stuff was happening. When was this um, picture taken? Sometime before 2008. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's the current ones. This one, too, in 2004, it's shown there. Uh, So I, I looked at uh, Google Earth and tried to figure out. But so you don't know. This is in the area of where the accessory structure is going, and the tree's not there well, anymore. It's actually not going there. It's the accessory structures. It, this is an old survey here, and I. Right. Um, and yeah, the, the accessory structure is really going where that that oak tree. It looks That's like, where and, the, and we've never seen it. It's never. Yeah, I mean, it's it's going back up in this area, so it wouldn't even be in the location. There's a there's a pepper tree in this spot right here. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a little scraggly pepper tree. It's not even growing very well, mm -hmm. and that that would be taken out for the accessory building. Yeah, we've never um, seen that. This okay. tree, not aware of. I, I've owned the property since last year, and I looked at Google Earth and 
couldn't find pictures of that tree. Yeah, this is from our maps program. We have it back from 1989. This is 1998. They have old images. So this is an old image, and I, I mean, I understand that, you know, I mean, we have no knowledge of, of that tree. And, okay, that's yeah. fine. That was just a question. So. All right. Did you want to add any more? Or can I open the public hearing? Uh, yeah. I, I, okay. I okay. Okay. Um, so I'd like to open the public hearing uh, for 1425 Mission Ridge Road. Is there anyone here who would like to address the staff and officer on this project? No? Like I said, I did receive um, the letters that were included in the staff report, and I, I read all the letters, and they're all supportive of your project and excited to see you propose it. Um, so then I'll close the public hearing. So in regards to your requests, um, with the... Which one do I start with? Uh, well, I can start with the request for the accessory space in the front yard, um, the modification to allow it in the, the front yard versus the front yard setback. Um, <clears throat> I understand the site layout and the design um, options of your property. I don't review it the same way as um, you had proposed regarding, you know, it could be two units if it was only a little bit bigger. Um, I didn't even think of it being a second unit because it's proposed mm -hmm. as a youth, as a yoga studio with no cooking facilities. Right. And I would assume there's probably going to be a zoning compliance declaration signed um, that would disallow it for being um, from being converted to or used as a second unit. In regards to its location, um, a property of this size, it is appropriate for it to have some kind of detached accessory space. We mm -hmm. see that all the time. I don't agree that this would be an appropriate location and that it would even get go far with the design review board. So saying that it would be down here, I'm not sure if that would be a realistic type option that the design board would support. However, given in this area, um, you're not really avoiding slopes. I don't know the slope of this area, but it isn't you know, avoiding slopes. But the main concern that I would have with this type of structure in the front yard is its visibility from the street and its character with the neighborhood. And when you look at um, neighboring properties around there, they do have, like, here's an instance with just the house is similar uh, setback from the street. I know it kind of curves here, but, um, you know, it is a similar setback. It's a, a, observing the 30-foot setback. It is lower than the street, and there is more vegetation in this area. Um, so in terms of the views from the street, I, I could support your request to have the, the um, yoga studio here in the, in the front Thank setback. Um, in regards to the request for extra garage space, I am actually struggling with that, and I'll tell you why. Um, I agree that this property is large. It's over an acre, and so on flat lots or different lots, having excessive garage size, or not excessive, over um, regulations of the garage size is appropriate. However, this one is a sensitive site in terms of the views. Um, this is a public park. Um, the preservation of public views is really important, and that's why I was asking you, um, your ideas about the, the broad, what I call the broadness of the property and the heights. Um, so I'm struggling with it because I think it is uh, over garage size is appropriate. Um, just the, the design and making it less visible from the street. So then I'll get on to the um, substantial performance request. Um, my comments regarding that um, is that I know there wasn't a height limit placed on it. It was a story limitation. Um, but all the documentations I see points to that 19-foot high um, ridge height and having it you know, unobstructed. And so um, a 22-foot tall one-story structure, that's pretty big. That's pretty tall for a one-story, and is that really necess necessary for um, for the one story and to still be in conformance with that condition. So I would be re reluctant to say that I would find this in substantial conformance with that um, requirement. Um, another input staff could have is to go to the design board and specifically discuss that condition in regards to um, preservations of views from Fran Franceschi Park because there's not really any relief. It's all straight and it bumps up. There's not really any relief and you're getting into this area um, 
that is, as you can see in the, in the, the um, well, they can't see, you have to look upside down because for the TV, it has to be facing towards me. <laughs> but, you know, it's getting, it's getting wider, so it's taking up more view. Um, so I don't, I don't believe the current proposal is in substantial conformance with it, but I could, um, I could improve the request for the oversized garage because I, I think it is appropriate to give direction to the single family design board to look about re uh, reducing the, the massing or height um, to pre pre preserve as much ocean and then what it, um, city views in this area. So I don't actually make a, I just provide input on the substantial mm -hmm. conformance part. I don't make a determination that that is a staff level review, but they're asking for my, my input on it. But I could, the good news is that I could support both of your mods where a staff was recommending denial of your um, the, uh, accessory structure okay. space in the front yard. May I comment? Um, quickly. Okay. Um, looking at the restrictions that were put on the property by the prior owners because of what they did with the walls and things. We were, I spent a lot of time around Franceschi Park trying to figure out this view corridor. Um, and the best place I could find it was actually at the stop sign. Mm -hmm. um, this is just a small corner of Franceschi Park. The body of Franceschi Park is actually way over here. Um, the photo that you're showing here uh, doesn't show all the greenery that it's actually in this side of the property now in the trees. And there's almost no view through that spot. The view is very strong on this side of the property uh, when you look from the street. And okay, we've spent a lot, of, a lot of time and effort to mm -hmm. try to fulfill the requirements and be very continent of uh, the issues here. Is that we wanted to create a, a property that was fits everybody's needs and, and would be happy, <laughs> as we say, for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, I know it's a difficult balance to get, and this is something we've struggled with, and we thought we came up with the best solution because uh, we have lowered the floors of the house and that tried to lower the roof but keep the volume in, inside the house because this is, as you understand, this is a very expensive project and, and it needs to be done in such a manner so when resale ever happens, when I'm not here anymore, that it justifies the expense of what's being put into this property. Mm -hmm. And all that stuff staff will take into consideration. Um, you know, I'm just one, one voice putting in for their determination and mm -hmm. that was just, that's what my uh, opinion is. Yeah, and I greatly appreciate your opinion. Okay, great. So then you, um, oh, okay. So we'll ask you this question. You read the conditions in the staff report and you agree with them? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So um, I would like to add two conditions. One um, is that I can, I can support the request for the oversized garage, but um, a request or refer it to the single family design board, although they're already going to review it, that they look at um, preserving as much as the existing view from Franceschi Park mm -hmm. slash road um, to reduce the massing and height. Um, and then the other one is that um, uh, the oak tree that was removed, the mysterious tree, if it, um, it should be removed. Uh, the conditions of prior proof says five to one, but I'm fine with a three to one basis. Um, and I'm not going to specify Fine. where you fit it. You'll do a landscape plan and you'll, you'll fit it in somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then also that arborist report will be required. Um, and it will have, um, if, if monitoring is required, a final report will need to be submitted just outlining the findings yeah. of, of monitoring. So it just depends on what the outcome of that report is um, on if you'll need to do follow-up on it. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So with those two... Um, conditions. I can make the findings outlined in a. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, do I? Okay, let me or read them. The, uh, front, uh, accessory in front. Okay. Yeah. It says the staff member finds that the detached accessory space is not consistent. So it is consistent with the purpose of intent and zoning ordinance. 
and here's a, ne a necessary improvement. So I'll change the finding um, to reflect the fact that um, it, it's uh, you know low profile, not visible or um, not obstruct view, not significantly obstruct view because the house is behind it that way in landscaping. Make the findings. I actually <laughs> switch. We want to remember what it is. <laughs> yeah. So okay. So um, I changed finding number two um, to approve the um, detached accessory space in the front yard, and then um, yeah, you'll continue to work on the substantial conformance determination of the with the show, and that's one of the conditions. Mm -hmm. So my action is appealable to the Planning Commission within 10 calendar days, and they also have oversight authority of all my actions, and if they felt this warranted additional discussion before them, they could call it up during that same 10-day review period, and if either of those would occur, Joanne would contact you. Okay. Okay? Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Have a good day. So I'm going to leave that set. That's yours. Uh, not the, the, uh, the, the shop pictures. Yeah. 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 And if you have a minute, I can meet with you outside. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Sure. Okay. So I want to okay, the next item is 969 is Lefta Road. If the applicant would like to come up to the table. Michelle Bedard, staff planner for this project. This parcel is located at 969 Isleta Avenue on the um, Upper East Mesa side of the town. Here's some neighborhood photographs. Let me pull those off for a moment, please. Uh, this is the subject parcel. Some photos from the rear, photos from the front, aerial photo of the subject property here, photo of the garage, photo of some rear backyard elements. Turn over here to the site plan page. So the proposed project is uh, the existing project parcel is developed with an existing single family residence, one story, approximately 1,200 square feet in size with an attached approximately 390 square foot two car garage on this lower level. Um, the proposed project involves 290 square feet of one-story additions and approximately 560 square feet of a new second story um, and then some minor site work in the front including replacement of the entry porch and steps etc so as you see outlined here the pink is the property line the yellow highlight is the existing building footprint the green is the current required setbacks and the orange outline is the proposed one and two story additions the um, the existing development was originally constructed at a time that it conformed with the required setbacks. The property was later rezoned from R1 to E1, which made the residence an existing legal nonconforming structure. And now the residence is encroaches approximately five feet into both interior setbacks and approximately nine feet into the front 30 foot now 30 foot front setback. So the proposed application requires three modifications, two, um, three of which result in a change to the basic exterior characteristics of the existing residence, adding a second story addition to the existing one story non-conforming single family residence. And those are again both interior and in the front. You'll see by, outlined in the orange, the proposed additions conform to the required setback. The um, third component of the front setback modification is the encroachment of the revised entry porch st stairs and um, deck in the front setback. So if you turn to the next page, so here's just some elevations here. 
the existing garage, as noted in the staff report, is slightly undersized, and it actually has this fireplace structure, which encroaches into the required 394 square foot usable area of the garage. The usable area is approximately 326 square feet, if you just look at this element. So the project involves um, transportation review and uh, of a garage waiver to maintain that existing garage configuration as is and because the amount of additions exceeds 50% of the existing residential square footage. So that's outlined in the staff report as a minor condition. Transportation staff has already looked at that and has given preliminary concept level support. Um, so here you'll see this is the exist or this is the existing and proposed floor plan. This is the proposed one story addition at the rear and then this is the proposed second story addition over the existing footprint. Um, the entry porch and steps I've outlined here in yellow, at least the existing entry porch. And then there's some existing steps. The, um, and then the orange you'll see is the proposed configuration. And I've drawn in some dimensions here so you can get perspective. So the green line again is your 30 foot front setback. The existing building is nine feet into the required setback. That is about two and a half feet current configuration and depth, and they're proposing to expand it by eight and a half feet here um, from the front property line, and that would be approximately 12 feet from the front property line. So it's almost doubling the amount of existing encroachment to the front setback. I'll just give you some quick elevations here. So again, this is existing garage, existing residence. This is the proposed porch as you would see it, existing entry steps. They currently enter the property from the driveway up some steps, and then this would be the entry steps and the elevations of the porch. That's the side elevation of the proposed new porch and deck. And then they propose some renderings. The project was reviewed by the Single Family Design Board on September 21st, 2015, and was granted favorable comments. Continued to the staff hearing officer of the board specifically like the architectural style and praise the architect on the location of the second story to help preserve some neighbor views concerns. Um, and here's just an enlarged plan and landscape plan of the proposed entry level deck. So as proposed, again, the discretionary applications, three modifications, two interior setback modifications for the non-conforming building additions, conforming additions to the non-conforming building and uh, the front setback as well because the building's non-conforming. Staff is supportive of the proposed interior modifications and the front setback modification as it relates to the proposed additions because the additions are conforming to the required setback and their technical in nature. Staff is making a recommendation to revise the amount of front entry porch as proposed, staff is not supportive of this configuration because it nearly doubles the amount of existing con um, encroachment into the front setback. So staff has come up with what we feel is a reasonable consideration and made a recommendation that they, staff recognizes that the existing porch and stairs are very narrow and very small in width, and approximately two and a half feet in width at the landing at the porch. Staff recommendation, it's kind of outlined in light red pencil there. It'd be about seven feet by five feet. Seven feet is the distance from the top step to the existing wall, and five feet would just seemed reasonable to pretty much double the existing porch length. Um, so based on those comments, staff would recommend that the staff hearing officer approve the project as proposed, subject to the conditions outlined on the revised configuration of the porch. Okay, great. That concludes my report. Okay, I don't have any questions for you right now. Okay. Would you like to state your name for the record and provide additional comments? Yeah, uh, my name is Patrick Marr. I'm a local architect, and these are my clients, Paul and Pat Chrisman, who they currently live in Camarillo, and when this project's all complete, they'll be relocating to Santa Barbara. Okay. Do you have anything to add? I, 
-hmm. Yes. <laughs> uh, our primary positions in obtaining the modifications are regarding the interior setback modifications, our design conforms to the current setback requirements, and the proposed change to the basic character of the building is consistent with the character of the other houses in the neighborhood, so it seems fairly benign to us. Uh, regarding the front porch back uh, setback modification, our intent and goals in our proposed design are one, we'd like the porch to be functional as the primary means of access. There's no, currently there's no interior uh, garage access uh, to the house and it's not easily achievable just due to the existing configuration and uh, a route down along the uh, side yard where there's a, f a five foot setback on the side that uh, it's circuitous and just not very functional. Uh, our second goal with the proposed design was to make the porch aesthetically pleasing, incorporating a variety of massing, concealing the stairs, and making it not look quite so flat or tacked on as the current configuration. The single family design board reviewed, or reviewed the proposed design and the majority of the board found the proposed design aesthetically appropriate and they found the size, the proposed size of the porch to be appropriate to the style of architecture. We've studied uh, various other uh, setbacks. Uh, this is the proposed design. This is the staff recommendation. And there's a few other iterations in between those. And we just like the aesthetics of our proposed design. Uh, I really like the ability to conceal the stairs. And uh, we like the massing and whatnot of uh, the proposed design. So anyway. Um, and I'm Paul Chrisman. And just to expand a little bit more, um, the house with the slope in the front, the access on the existing front um, entrance is extremely small. We've had three meetings with Joanne as we got into this project and discussed that it would be you know, a challenge to create something that was going to be suitable uh, entrance with a two and a half foot depth. You can imagine how difficult it is to move into the house. Uh, and, and the appearance, it looks like it's kind of just tacked on to the front. So that was part of, in, even in, I think, in the third meeting with Joanne, she said that they probably wouldn't allow the size of the front entrance that we were taking to the single family design board, but we put it in anyways. Their comment came back that it was size appropriate to the style and the architecture. Um, I guess the issue we have is we're certainly willing to accept a slightly smaller one, however, even five foot um, situations like moving in furniture. We raise guide dogs, Joanne has met our, our guide dog puppy three times, and. Uh, we have visiting guide dogs and coming upstairs with an extremely narrow area. The staff report commented on five foot would give you adequate standing area. We really don't feel that, for instance, my mother-in-law visits who has a walker, uh, several people, bags, several dogs. We feel that the area is inadequate and even to some degree unsafe. Uh, Certainly last night coming up the stairs, it's raining and you're hanging out over a railing. I'm very tall. It's a nine foot drop from the top of the railing down to the hardscape below. So I think we're in agreement with everything, Michelle, everything you, you said was very factful, but uh, you know, do we need 11 foot? No, uh, eight foot would be you know, a very suitable area for coming in, swinging things, for positioning people and things. So we don't feel that the five foot is um, you know, suitable and appropriate. Um, and going a little bit larger, we, it has no adverse impact on the neighbors. When you look at the neighbor's house, it's, it's quite a bit above us, and the next house, yes. because it's on a curve, is really out of the site. Um, it was mentioned that it was R1, which would have had, as I, as I read it on the ground level, a 15-foot setback and uh, 20 foot on an upper story. We're sort of dealing with the constraints of the lot, the placement of the existing house, but our goal is to provide a very nice house for the neighborhood, one that we can retire into, but one that has a functional and safe front porch. Mm -hmm. Which it, hi, I'm Pat Chrisman. Is that, can I speak? 
<laughs> okay, I'll move. There you go. Patrick's laughing. Um, one of the things is we would like to age in place there for a while. And those stairs going up the way they are are very steep. They hurt. They actually hurt my knees now. So I, we wanted to do an intermediate landing. And to do that, you know, to achieve that, though, we did want to hide it a bit. We're not having a whole bunch of stairs in the front. That's one thing. The second thing is it is a little, it's a little spooky up there. It's, it's raised. It's not like it, we're asking for um, a surface at ground level. It, it's raised. And when you're up there and you've got, you know, your, your rail, your required rail, all that, it, it's still high. And I really would like at least a couple more feet out to be able to maneuver and feel like my back's not up to the fence, which it, it can be. And also, you get, we do raise the guide dogs. We can have a couple at a time. And it is, with all the paraphernalia and everything else, it is difficult. I know that's a one-off to, to, you know, what other people require. I know that's just, you know, kind of something we need. But I, I still think just in maneuverability, and I, I think we need, do need a few more feet than, than what we've been granted, at least width-wise, uh, or depth-wise, I should say. Um, I do feel that it fits in with the... the um, the uh, landscape, the actual, I mean, the, the street is pretty, it's mature, it's got curves, we're gentle sloping in the front, this way we're gentle sloping going up. So it's not like it's all this big flat, you know, in the middle of the street somebody sees this big, you know, porch coming at you. It, it is attractive, and I, I believe it will be, and um, we've really tried hard. We've met with our neighbors next door, the one that you see the house there, five times. Not on everything. These people have, you know, seen all of our plans in detail, including our porch across the street as well, those impacted. So we have just multiple times met with people. We've been a year and a half in the making of this, so we've really thought it out quite well. We didn't realize a lot about encroachments when we, you know, talked about the 11 foot, you know, oh, it sounds nice. Now we understand, <laughs> but we are asking for a little bit more than, than the current and we do understand about setbacks and we do appreciate it because once we're investing this money we don't want you know any we, we want to keep it nice too mm -hmm. so we get it we get what you're doing and one and final point also when you look at this will have or still looks like the front is just kind of tacked on mm -hmm. and, and everybody has sort of said from the very beginning that four foot width is much more appropriate Joanne told us that from the very beginning to go from four foot to five foot at the entrance is really insignificant and hard, kind of hard to accept. When you look at the architectural, and this is what the Single Family Design Board said, when you look at this version that hides the stairs in the back, mm -hmm. it has a much more pleasing appearance on the front of the house than this that appears to be just tacked on. Okay. Um, so in regards to the deck itself, what is the height from here, uh, from the driveway mm -hmm. versus the front? Um, when I, when I scale it, it looks like this is 13 feet, about. Yeah, that's um, about right. And about nine from here to here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're We have a landscape person that's going to be working with us. I mean, everything will be professionally done. We're not just plopping things, and that will all be part of design review. They'll be looking at all that and assuring, and there's people on that committee as well that will be checking up to make sure that we <coughs> landscape appropriately for that porch. And so... We're asking again if we could get maybe something a little bit bigger than stated. Okay, great, thank you. I'd like to open the public hearing. Is there anyone here who would like to address the staff hearing officer on 969 Isleta Avenue? See, no one, I don't remember any letters attached to the, have you received any letters? Or we did receive one letter from the property owners okay. that was included in the okay. secretary yeah. packet. Okay, great, thank you. So I'll close the public hearing. Um, I did go out to the site and over around the neighborhood, and I agree with your conclusion that it does look like it was an afterthought. It was just tacked on there. 1941. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think, um, you know, any, whether it's five feet, six feet, what you're proposing, it would be an improvement in terms of the streetscape. Right. Um, but first I'll talk about the requested interior setback modifications and the front setback modification as it relates to your second story addition. Um, I really appreciate the fact that you are respecting the setbacks for your second story addition. That's really important um, for both neighborhood preservation, view preservation, neighborhood or neighbor relations and all that. Mm -hmm. um, what you're proposing is not a significant second story, although the combined addition does increase your house by more than 50%. It's done in such a way 
that it's not, um, it, I could find it consistent with the purpose and intent of the building ordinance for the second story. Um, in regards to the um, front setback related to the deck, I agree with staff that the amount of the uh, encroachment is, is on the, uh, the large <coughs> size. And when you speak to the fact of hiding the stairs and the fact that you were wanted, I forget how many more feet, um, what did you envision um, to say in terms of hiding the stairs? Like, let's say that, you know, I'd compromise and say, you know, this area, would you propose the deck to go all the way out here or would this be landscape screening out? Because the justifications that were given in the letter are kind of confusing um, that I didn't know if they were speaking towards the reduced deck area because staff didn't have any concerns with the stairways and the stairway is you know pretty wide and so with the guide dogs and all that it seems like what you're proposing here is adequate or you would have asked for more so I'm kind of confused it's on what um, we're, we're comfortable with the four foot wide stairs. Okay. It's primarily once you get to the top of the stairs, you know, staging area and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And there comes a point where the distance from the stairs to the front of the porch, when that gets too small, then it makes it, you end up with a, a totally unfunctional area here that purely serves to hide the stairs and doesn't do anything else. And so, you know, coming out six feet from the front of the garage instead of the uh, eight and a half feet, you know, still seems workable. Uh, when we cut it down less than that, then this little appendage gets, you know, it hides the stairs, but it becomes totally non-functional. So then you end up uh, probably getting rid of that then the stairs become exposed and it's sort of it, it starts to morph into the staff's recommended solution so I would think you know something more akin to you know this would be it would achieve the aesthetic goals I think it would add to the neighborhood and I think that you know it would probably be acceptable functionally <clears throat> Um, okay, that answers that question. Um, okay, well, um, like I said, when I went out, oh, actually, the other question. Now, um, how far is the, sh the sheltered part, the covered part? Well, the existing roof, basically, there's a... This right here. Yeah, mm -hmm. more or less, and so it just shelters the... Okay. When you're standing right in front of the door, and that's it. So with this proposal, the shelter would still only go out to the face of the garage. Right, we're not, right, not going to change the roof, mm -hmm. uh, other than there is an existing post right at that corner that we're going to get rid of. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. okay. Um, so in regards to the request for the, um, the front setback for your uh, entry porch and, and deck area, like I started to say, I agree with the existing situation that it looks like it, it's just tacked <laughs> on. And if you're going to go to all these improvements to your house, you should make the frontage look more street more. friendly yes, and, right. um, and uh, you know, blend in. You look a lot better. So I, I think this is a good solution, a compromise between um, what you're asking for and what staff is proposing. Having it six feet from the um, front face, it still provides some relief of your front mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. elevation is not straight across. Mm -hmm. And so I could support this, uh, this setup. And what that would mean in terms of the conditions, uh, the first condition talks about mm -hmm. the proposed reconfiguration of the entry port shall be designed as recommended above to allow for improvements to function as entry porch, not a deck. I would change that condition that it would be the maximum. Um, well, this was seven feet here? Yeah, the idea is that the, the edge of the deck, and the edge of the deck um, not extend more than six feet from the face of the garage. Mm -hmm. That's very workable. 
And then the um, only covered part is just this area right here, and I'll have to figure out how to word it. But I, um, I, my approval does not include the covering of the whole deck. Okay. That yeah, this is, this is actually the porch, and it's just the entryway. Um, yeah, or okay. possibly say something about no change to the existing roof okay. configuration or something. To um, maybe an area covered by roof or something, because you probably want to re make it match with what you're changing, just the the area, you know, the dimensions. And actually, other than getting rid of the post, I was pretty much just going to leave it the way it is. Okay. Yeah. Unless, uh, yeah. Uh, because it, yeah. there's always okay. complicating factors. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it, it, there's actually a change in the roof right at that line, uh, a vertical step, so it <laughs> okay. works out well. Yeah, we'll the, yeah so we'll craft the yeah, condition, and what it will be is that the um, edge of the deck not extend further than six yes. feet out mm -hmm. from the face of the garage, and that the covered area um, be no greater than what exists today. Or yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> so my action is appealable to that. So I'll, with that, I'll make the finding. Oh, I need to change the finding. No, I don't, because they were recommending approval just cut down. Um, so with that, I'll make the findings outlined in the staff report and approve your project sub subject to the conditions of approval as we just discussed them being revised. Okay. My action is appealable to the Planning Commission within 10 calendar days, and they also have oversight authority of all my actions, and if they felt this warranted additional discussion before them, they could call it up during that same 10-day review period, and if either of those would occur, Michelle would contact you. Mm -hmm. okay. 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 All right. Well, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and keep this for reference for our file. Sure. Okay. Would you like this to? No, we have to. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Here, Patrick, I'll give you these others back. I'm just going to keep the one that she references. Okay. As far as <laughs> approval. So the next item is 118 North Milpas, if the applicant would like to come up. And I'd also like to announce, if you are interested in addressing the staff hearing officer and provide public comments on this item, if you haven't yet submitted a request to speak form, which is the green sheets over on the table there, you know, please fill it out and hand it to um, Julie, and she will give them to me. Anytime you're ready, Tony. Good morning, Ms. Reardon. I'm Tony Bauman, Assistant Planner. And this is an application at 118 North Milpa Street for a medical cannabis dispensary. So the required application is a medical marijuana storefront collective dispensary permit. Um, just as a reminder, the city ordinance allows for a maximum of three dispensaries in the city, and there can be one in each of five possible areas. This one is proposed at Milpa Street, and here's a kind of an aerial photo, like a vicinity map kind of thing, and I highlighted the subject parcel. It's in the one, well, the Milpa Street area, uh, the allowed locations on Milpa Street are the zero to 400 blocks of North Milpas. So this is in the 100 block. And this is a, a closer view of the site. So it's between East Mason and East Yonanali. It's a 4,449 square foot C2 commercial zone property surrounded by mostly residential, but a mix of residential and commercial uses. Um, that's some site photos. So here's the building, 118 North Milpas. It's a little commercial building. Um, 
There's a view of the front looking down the sidewalk. Another close view. Uh, there's a curb cut and a driveway. There's the old curb cut and a driveway, but the archive plans never show any parking on this property. One of the old plan sets, I think it was an application. This was a previous existing commercial building, and then I don't remember what year they added this addition to it. And the plan set just referred to a delivery driveway. So we recognize this property as being legal non-conforming with no on-site parking. There was a recent uh, repair and remodel to the building and transportation planning. In fact, one of the correction, one of the improvements they made at that time was a compliant accessible ramp. And one of the corrections was to block the driveway by adding a planter because we didn't want anybody even trying to park in the site. It's, there's not enough width between the building and the property line to turn a vehicle around. And vehicles are not allowed to back out of a commercial property, especially at this part of Milpa Street. So here's the, a large site plan. Let me uh, get to that part. So I outlined the property in green and outlined the building in blue um, and indicated the entry. So this is the property line. This is the actual property line, but this is the effective property line because this is the edge of the city right away, the back of the sidewalk. So the building's outlined in blue. <coughs> This is that area where there used to be a delivery driveway that I was talking about. Um, and I highlighted the, this is the main entry, the front entry. It has a couple of steps going up. And just less than a couple of years ago, in 2014, they added this ramp. So they have a fully accessible side entry. So if people need to use this, they would be allowed to use this entry or this one. Here's the proposed waiting area. Um, and then this is where the, I'll let the applicant explain his flow and his operation in more detail. But you interact with staff through this window. And then you're allowed into the dispensing area. They're proposing to use movable rolling display cases. Um, and then it, when the business is closed, they would all roll them back and store them in the a vault that they'd be building with strong walls, um, new restrooms. Um, office space. We have interior photographs too if you need to refer to them. Um, I was just going to go through the requirements quickly. Um, the application complies with the location limitation being in that zero to 400 block of North Miltus. Uh, it seems to be a site, a good site in terms of visibility. It's close, only set back approximately five street, five feet from the public right of way. Uh, the side door also has good visibility. They're proposing a fence to secure this outdoor area, but it would be a see-through fence, again, maintaining good visibility. They're proposing a whole new landscape plan. Uh, this is currently concrete in front of the building. That's all concrete area there, so they're proposing to take that out and put in landscaping. All the landscaping would be low to maintain visibility into the site. So then there are 12 criteria for issuance of a permit. So I'll just go through those, just touching on what we've covered in the staff report. Uh, the first one is it complies with intent of the Compassionate Use Act and SB 420 and the Santa Barbara Municipal Code. And we feel that it, it does comply um, in terms of the operation plan, security plan, and signed affidavits from the applicant. Second criterion, um, that the location is not identified by the city police as an area of increased or high crime activity. They did confirm with me that it is not. Uh, number three doesn't apply to this applicant because he has not operated any former dispensary in the city. Number four, the size is appropriate. 
Of course, he's using the existing commercial building as it is, but it seems like the size is appropriate. He's got a fairly large waiting area, and he describes in the operations plan how that is hoped to reduce the potential for loitering because there's plenty of room for people to wait inside. They don't need to be outside. It seems like the size is appropriate. Um, number five, would serve the needs of city residents within proximity. Um, this is in the Milpas neighborhood and centrally located among the east side neighborhoods of the city. Um, this, in fact, the Milpas area is the only one of those five potential areas on the east side of the city. So it would provide access. Um, and it's pretty well served by MTD buses. Number six, criterion six, the location is not prohibited and complies with location limitations. We already talked about that. And then Criterion 7 talks about the operations plan, site plan, floor plan, really the proposed physical improvements to the building. Um, so the applicant's proposing full security cameras inside and out, <coughs> uh, secured uh, doors and locks, and uh, windows to really, really this part of the building is, has a lot of beefed up security. So it seems to comply with that. He's proposing two security guards, uh, an alarm system, the camera, security camera recordings would be stored in the vault. Criterion 8 uh, really focuses on controlling the patron's conduct. Um, with regard to disturbances, vandalism, traffic control, marijuana use in public, interference of operation of another business. So that's uh, addressed by the operations plan. The, it's basically the two securities jobs duties to control patrons' conduct. The application also proposes a zero tolerance clause in the membership agreement so that if members do misbehave, they're immediately expelled or kicked out of the collective. Uh, we need to get an updated membership agreement form because, and maybe I missed it, but I didn't see that zero tolerance clause that's described in the document. I didn't see that language on the actual form. Um, and also there would be proposed on-site signage presumably in the waiting room to, again, reiterate the expected member behavior. And that would be something we would look for. And we can, uh, you know, verify those items in permit plan checks. Criterion 9 is kind of an overall uh, consideration that the dis proposed dispensary would likely have no adverse effect on the health, peace, safety, of people living and working in the surrounding area and not burden the neighborhood or contribute to a public nuisance. Um, and it looks like the proposed operations plan would do that. There's adequate lighting, security cameras. Uh, one, of the, one of the two security guards would patrol the exterior at least once an hour um, to look to see that the street and sidewalk are free of loitering and other businesses are not negatively affected. Uh, this patrolling guard would watch for alcohol, cannabis use, nuisance issues, pick up litter, report graffiti. This is all just straight from the applicant's plan. Um, and in his plan, it, he addresses uh, this, we thought in pretty good detail and depth and explanation starting on page 31, like page 31 through 39. It looks like a pretty thorough response to these criteria, really these 7, 8, and 9. Um, and moving on to criterion 10, uh, provision of municipal code or permit, local or state law will not be violated. Um, we haven't uh, identified any concerns with that in the application and also a reminder the staff hearing officer has the authority to suspend or revoke the permit if any of these things happen.
Uh, criterion 11, the applicant has not made a false statement of material fact or admitted to state a material fact. We don't have any concerns with that. And Criterion 12, the applicant is not engaged in unlawful, fraudulent, unfair, deceptive business practices in the city. Uh, the applicant passed the required background check with the police department, signed a statement in his application, but he has not done that. And staff is not aware of any problems with this applicant, so we don't have any concerns with that. Um, it's not a not within the criterion, but I did want to discuss a little bit about the parking because, as we described, the site doesn't have any on-site parking, and as we understand it, they'll be relying on street parking or alternate transportation for employees and customers. So we discussed that a bit, but. Staff's point of view on this issue is really that just this is a, the dispensary ordinance. In fact, says that a dispensary is a commercial use in terms of the parking ordinance. Um, so, staff's point of view on the parking problem is that the site is just legal non-conforming. It didn't have any parking. There's no requirement in the ordinance for a dispensary to provide parking because it's considered like any other commercial use. Um, so we realize that that's. A functional problem, but you know the ordinance itself doesn't require anything to be required for that for the permit. Uh, the project went to the ABR on their consent agenda on November 16th, and they were perfectly okay with it. They didn't even suggest any changes. Uh, the main reason I sent it to the consent agenda, the architectural changes are minor, but I wanted them to consider the fence. Was it appropriate? For the style of the building and also they're proposing a full landscape plan so the ABR landscape architect looked at that and she was fine with it and they continued that their action was continued to the staff hearing officer and they said it could return to staff for approval okay. um, environmental review uh, qualifies for an exemption categorical exemption <coughs> under section 15301 for existing facilities um, so staff uh, believes that the application conforms to the ordinance. Therefore, we recommend that the staff hearing officer approve the project, making the findings, uh, which are that it complies with the location criteria and with the 12 criteria for issuing the permit. And we've attached conditions of approval. And those are just, they're really all standard conditions on any project. The one particular to a dispensary application is that they install an alarm system and uh, register it and have a separate alarm system permit. So that's it for my presentation. Okay, I actually do have one question. Um, this went through DART, right? Right. Okay, so um, since they are blocking off access to what at one time may have been either a parking area or loading, unloading area. Um, the condition here talks about repair, damage, public improvements regarding curb cut or including curb cuts, gutters, sidewalk, roadway. There was no um, requirement to remove the existing curb cut and replace with um, curb gutter. That would give more parking. Right? That was discussed. Staff suggested that. Rec I guess you could say we recommended that, but the applicant, he did discuss that with Public Works. Um, he was a little deterred by the expense of it. I'm not sure what that expense was. I think was. it is a re um, an allowance in the municipal code that we re could require it on commercial properties. Hmm. I didn't you know, see Stacey, that. you want to come up here? Do you know Stacey Wilson's transportation planner? I can understand not wanting to do it. We can still just take this fine. Okay. We, didn't, we don't have the extra. We can maybe borrow. You can sit here if you want. Hi, Stacy Wilson with Transportation. So we did, um, or I, I work in Public Works. I'm one of the divisions in, in Public Works. And, and with my colleagues in engineering, we did um, investigate that issue as to whether or not it's something we could require to close the curb cut. We weren't able to require that. We did make a recommendation and talk about it with the applicants and for the future. Okay, great. That helps a lot, Stacey. Thank you. 
Oh, did you give any idea on the expense of that improvement? Um, I'm a, I'm a little uncertain about what the expense was. It's you know something certainly that you would want to bid, but um, I was trying to remember um, if I had uh, received a quote from our inspector on that. Um, not finding anything in my um, in my email or other documentation, I went and asked at our our public works front counter. Their rough estimate was that it might cost fifteen hundred dollars to close up the driveway. So what that procedure would be is to cut out and remove the driveway, replace it with parkway, curb, and gutter. It, but it's an estimate without knowing very much of the information. So 1500 you said? Yes. Could I add a little to that information? Um, we'll wait. Just okay. A sec. Um, okay, great. Thank you. That was my only question for right now. So, yeah, yeah if you want to state your name for the record, provide additional comments, and you are limited to 15 minutes total. Okay. I'll just quickly, while I'm thinking about it, add uh -huh. a couple of notes on the curb cut. I'm Bill Wolf, Pacific Architects. Um, I know that you may have met uh, pro pro probably somebody with Public Works out there at the site, and there was some discussion about the slope of the sidewalk and interface with the ramps. And the landing. And the landing, yeah. and he felt that it was difficult uh, to make those comply with ADA requirements. So possibly it would there. have to be moved back. Okay. Hey. Oh, sorry. My, yep. my name is Ryan Howe. I'm the applicant for 118 North Milpas. Another suggestion thought as well was that uh, could that spot be better applied to a space where a handicapped person might be able to get in and out of their car? Not necessarily do we stripe it as a handicapped space, but getting in and out where there's a curb is a little more difficult than a space where there's a no curb, although the slope is a challenge still. So just a thought. You can't park in front of a curb cut though. Regardless if it's used or not, correct? Well, I don't know. I mean, do you? Can you stripe it? Can you call it something different? Uh, is is there some advantage, in other words, to leaving it a uh, curb cut? Okay. Yeah, I don't know. That might be a question. No. Okay. <laughs> Just um, a thought. My my conversation with the transportation um, individual that came out to the site was that uh, had 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 that been or will. Or, or uh, if it if it does become a curb, um, that the handicap landing would have to be moved back, and which would uh, his his cost estimation to me was more like five to seven thousand dollars to do all of the work that would be needed. Um, so that just wanted to let you know that. But um, as I said before, my name is Ryan Howe. I'm the applicant. Um, I've uh, uh, Canopy is, uh, just for everybody's knowledge, uh, a holistic healing and wellness center uh, that will happen to serve, uh, if, if this gets approved, will happen to also serve cannabis. So in the traditional sense of a dispensary, um, how I think most people in the city remember or realize a dispensary, um, we will act and look much different, more, much more like a wellness and healing center uh, rather than a traditional dispensary. Um, in, uh, in talking with the community members, um, really over the last six months as I've been going through this process, um, I've been kind of noticing three main issues, uh, that have come up. Um, obviously one is parking, um, and I have done a pretty extensive analysis of the 100 block myself, um, seeing as I live in Santa Barbara, um, I'm there, uh, on Milpas almost every day, um, there are eight businesses currently operating on the 100 block of North Milpas. Um, three of those businesses uh, have their own parking lots to service their, their customers. Um, four of those businesses are uh, professional services businesses, um, which are really by appointment only, so require a very low volume of parking. And then, of course, there is one restaurant uh, near the corner of uh, Yana Nali and Milpas. Um, from what I have seen uh, and I have noticed over the past year, uh, the 100 block on Milpas, uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, during the daytime, uh, between the hours that we would propose to be open, 
uh, which would be eight and six. Um, there's adequate parking, plenty of parking um, uh, on the main strip on Milpas, uh, anywhere from 10 to 15 spots at any given moment dur during and throughout the day. Um, the, the type of business that, that Canopy is, um, we would really only be servicing between five to 10 patients per hour. Um, at the very maximum, uh, 13 to 14. Um, so our parking needs are actually relatively low uh, for, for what it is that we need to service our, our members. And because uh, our members have to be located within the city of Santa Barbara, um, uh, many of our members and certainly most of our employees uh, will either be walking or biking. Uh, to uh, we, we have included bike racks in the plan. I think we've included two bike racks when we were only supposed to... Uh, uh, when we were requested to, to offer one, we've actually offered two. So um, we're doing everything that we can um, to uh, alleviate the parking situation. Um, we we will be instructing our employees that if they absolutely have to, to drive their cars, to park in the industrial zones um, off of uh, Mason and Yananali, uh, not in the neighborhoods. We'll be instructing them not to park in the neighborhoods. Um, in addition to our membership uh, agreement uh, that uh, Mr. Allen has constructed for us, um, we will also be conducting a 30-minute interview and consultation process with each one of our members and each one of our patients um, when, they, uh, when they sign up uh, to be a member at, at Canopy. Um, this this uh, initial consultation session will address the parking issue. We have created a map um, uh, which which will be presented uh, to each member and each employee on on where uh, they can and and where we would want them to park. Um, so we do understand that uh, that parking is an issue on Milpas in, in living in this church. Sure. Yeah, absolutely, no, this is for you. We do understand that there's parking as an issue all over the city, um, but we don't feel th that we would impact um, the parking situation any more than, for example, the, jewel the jewelry store that was there before us. Um, so that's that's kind of my comment on that. Um, the second uh, the second issue that that uh, has arisen uh, on multiple occasions with the community and the people, the organizations and the people that I've spoken with in the community is the, um, the fear that uh, a higher crime rate will, will occur now that a, an organization like mine has moved into the premises. And so uh, in addition to all of the security measures that we have taken, um, I have also been talking uh, with members of the community and several of the community associations about implementing a neighborhood watch program. Um, it, it would be a very... Um, easy thing for us to do because we already have the security measures in place, including the security guards, one who will be patrolling the area uh, every hour. Uh, the other, of course, will be uh, staying in the store. Um, but uh, it would not be a burden on us to increase uh, the hours of our security team to have them come and um, patrol the area after hours and during a high crime times, uh, particularly at night between midnight and 3, 3 a.m. in the morning. Um, so there have been several discussions, and Canopy has agreed to fund the Neighborhood Watch program. Um, thirdly, there, there is uh, and has been some, some concerns about Canopy operating as a nonprofit organization. And in addition to uh, all of the measures that Mr. Allen and I have taken, uh, I just wanted to um, to convey that uh, my background and the background of my family uh, has been running non nonprofit corporations for over 30 years. Um, we currently have two nonprofit organizations that we run. Um, we are very familiar with how to run them. They are 501c3. Um, one is a stem cell uh, foundation. Uh, where we take people with uh, seriously life debilitating afflictions uh, that cannot otherwise afford stem cell treatment and who cannot be cured by regular means of Western medicine 
and we, we finance their treatment and we finance the research on behalf of them. The second is a, uh, a ministry program uh, which my brother runs and which I help him run, uh, which has been uh, in operation since the 60s. It was founded by my grandfather. Uh, and um, we support um, refugees and uh, orphans uh, all over the world in the Philippine Islands. Uh, as well as um, Thailand uh, and uh, Central America. So this is something that is not new to me. It is not new to people within my organization. Uh, running nonprofit corporations is something that we do and that we have done for many years. So um, I believe everything else um, has been addressed in the operations plan. Uh, and unless Mr. Allen has anything to say, um, I will bring my comments to a close. Okay. Do you want to state your name for the record? Or do you have yeah, well, I'm the attorney for I'm the attorney for the applicant, uh, and I think Ryan has stated uh, the current operation plan extremely well. Okay, great. Thank you, Joe Allen. Okay. Um, I do have a number of questions, but I think first I'm going to open the public hearing. Um, and hear from them. Usually what we do is we have them sit in this chair and use that speaker. Oh, okay, sure. Um, but I do want to note that I did receive um, a packet of information. Um, there was nine surveys and then three separate letters, two of which were already in the surveys. And the main issues that I gleaned from the um, letters that I received, the concerns was that this was not an appropriate location due to the schools nearby, uh, the lack of parking, concerns about public safety, the potential negative impacts including increased crime in the area, increased traffic, the um, existing problems regarding homelessness and gang activity in the area, concerns regarding decreasing property values, um, the other unrelated business um, operations that are proposed at the site including the classes and the, um, the um, festivals that are described in the report, and then um, questioning the unloading of pro products. So those are, the question, or those are the issues that I've read from here. So if you wanted to add to those, that's... And this is the last one. one. Okay, yeah, this I've read, You've too. You've seen that. Okay. And it actually has some of the same issues here. So um, you are limited to two minutes per person. Tony has a... Uh, um, timer that he will time. So the first person is Peter Thomas Del Bello, if you'd like to come up, followed by Rebecca Julia Gutierrez. Good morning. So you Good have morning. two minutes. Okay. Okay, do I start right now? Yes. Okay. My name is Pete Del Bello, and I am a Santa Barbara native who will be running for city council in 2017. I come to this issue from a unique perspective because I've seen all sides of this issue and I brought materials and uh, presented that to staff when I came in. I've known the east side for 44 years, all 44 years of my life as my family owns the property on 135 North Melpa Street and 132 Warner Maria Avenue. I know this neighborhood and I've talked to this neighborhood to gather their concerns about the proposed dispensary. As expected, I found a neighborhood that is angry at what it will do to property values and scared for the safety of their children and those attending nearby schools. This is a neighborhood that has known crime and gang activity for decades, so these concerns should be considered. As the founder and president of the International Chiari Association, I know the, that medical marijuana has helped people with many health problems. The application for the proposed dispensary at 2609 Delavina Street failed because of lack of parking. The Melpus location is even less parking in Warner Maria Avenue a one block street behind Melpus with many small children is already crowded with cars. The color photos on the front of the organization's summary of the canopy shows at least 10 chairs slash stools for visitors. Where are these visitors and employees going to park? Camarillo Police Commander Monica McGrath said medical marijuana dispensaries are cash only businesses, which raises the level of theft and robberies where they are located. She is quoted in the Ventura County Star, January 15, 2016.
that crime rates in areas surrounding dispensaries have, quote, skyrocketed, unquote. If the city of Santa Barbara is so intent on adding another dispensary, with the first and only being at 3617 State Street, it should first look at the West Pueblo medical area. It not only is one of five allowable locations in our city, but it is appropriately near medical offices and not near any schools. If common sense fails and the proposed dispensary of 118 North Memphis is somehow approved, I will report directly to the council every crime that is committed there. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, great, thank you. Then, uh, so Rebecca Gutierrez followed by Gloria uh, Cavallero. Yes. Close. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Rebecca Gutierrez and I live on Alisos, right on Alisos and Mason, just a block away from the area. And um, my concern is that the location is not appropriate for the amount of pede uh, pedestrian and vehicle traffic that would be added because of the um, because of this particular business, I've worked in the healthcare industry for 15 years, and I've worked at our Santa Bar local Santa Barbara neighborhood clinics. Um, and in my I'm, I don't doubt or question the efficacy of um, cannabis use for medical reasons. My concern is the amount of traffic for this particular location um, due to the pedestrian traffic um, because people walk to and from this location to get to Franklin School to get um, to other, other businesses in the area. Um, one other thing about this particular block is that the sidewalks are very buckled and uneven and it's a constant problem due to the trees. Um, and it, um, if we are going to expose people with pre-existing conditions with, you know, such as back pain and knee pain, you know, that would, that this, um, these particular issues would be used for, this is not the ideal location for these people to be walking to and from to get to the place where they're going to pick up their medication. Um, it just as this location would not be appropriate for a CVS, it's not appropriate for uh, a medical marijuana dispensary. Um, we are heavily impacted as a residential neighborhood because of the businesses on Milpa Street, which is something that we deal with. It's, it's, we, it's something that is getting worse, um, but we like the convenience of being able to walk to the businesses that we use. I like to be able to walk to Trader Joe's. I like to be able to walk to Rite Aid. Um, but I don't see so many people from the neighborhood using this business. I think a lot of people are going to be yeah. coming in from out of the neighborhood into this location. One of the things that's unique about our neighborhood, too, and our community members is that we're so vigilant and so careful after the death of Sergio Romero um, about our pedestrian safety. Mm -hmm. You need you to know? wrap up. Okay. Um, and, you know, people, there's corners that are difficult to navigate and people coming in from outside of the neighborhood are not going to be as aware and cognizant of um, pedestrian safety um, as, as we are now. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to finish with, you know, just like it wouldn't be appropriate for a CVS because of the, the location, um, it's not appropriate for a dispensary. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. So Gloria Calvarello and Sebastian Alana are out on Anna. Good, Good morning. morning. My name is Gloria Cavallaro and I'm a homeowner of the house on the corner of John and Ollie and Aliso Street, so in the 100 block, <clears throat> directly behind where the dispensary would be. Um, I was born and raised there. I grew up in the area. I went to Franklin, Santa Barbara Junior High and Santa Barbara High School, so I know the neighborhood very, very well. Uh, in fact, I've, uh, I'm a parent and had parents in all the public, uh, children in all the public schools, and I'm also head of a nonprofit. Um, and 
the dispensary is just in the wrong place. It's too close to school, it, where children walk to and from home and school. It's, uh, it's a neighborhood. And with all due respect, I appreciate the fact that you said parking could be in an industrial area. But this is not an industrial area. This is a residential area. And um, although I can also appreciate that it's a health and wellness center, it is just not appropriate for the neighborhood when there are ch so many children coming from all different directions walking in that neighborhood. Um, and that is my biggest concern, is that it's just too close to too many schools on Melpa Street. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. So Sebastian followed by S. They didn't, they did not fill out the name. Um, Mesa Community Association is the organization that they're representing. So if they know who that is. Okay. Good morning. Well, good morning. My name is Sebastian Aldana uh, Jr., uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Eastside resident. Uh, a small survey was done over the past few days. Uh, 14 were turned in at 11 a.m. yesterday and 5 at 3 p.m. So it was a total of 19. Uh, 18 were against and one was neutral but wanted uh, more detail about the nonprofit's plan and how to help the community. Um, I don't think I'll have enough time to read everything, so I do want to touch on one thing. <clears throat> on 114.16, uh, both uh, Ryan and I, uh, we were going to have a town hall meeting, but it was canceled due to the, plan, uh, to the city planner telling Ryan not to hand out any promotional info of his business until they have received final permitting status. How is that being fair to the community? The, the neighborhood feels they are being bamboozled on this project. That's what they're telling me. Your process needs adjusting. Uh, for one, property owners and tenants need to receive notice of public hearing. The tenants feel you are doing a disservice to the neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> business owners and residents are uptight and do not want the, the dispensary there. Uh, Ryan mentioned to me that he would prefer to not to be there either. Uh, he would rather be in the funk zone, in a, in, in a warehouse style building. And by doing this, by doing this, the dispensary would be away from families, children, and schools, as many have concerns about that. <clears throat> um, so I, I would ask uh, that you give Ryan the opportunity to open up in the funk zone, and therefore he would like to, and then, and then also the residents and businesses in that area uh, would, would, would be satisfied also. Uh, the Melpas area has various negative issues, uh, too much traffic, not enough parking, homeless problems. Um, <clears throat> I would go as far as uh, asking the, the Melpas corridor to be exempt from a, from a dispensary, just due to all the negative environment that it has already. The one time is up. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. Um, the one thing regarding the funk zone, I review the application that's before me. And so it was applied okay. for this site, so I can only review for this uh -huh. site. And, and, and I would like, to, just for the record, I would like to, to clear that, you know, regarding, uh, you know, being that we have the planner here, you know. Your, your time's up, I need to let Okay, but speak. I would like that cleared up. Okay, you can speak with him after uh, the hearing. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So, um, the email, Sharon. Mm -hmm. okay. It is. All right, so you want to state your name? Mm -hmm. I'm thank Sharon you. Byrne, and I'm with the Milpas <laughs> Community Association. And um, the, what do you want me to do? Just put your hand in there, it's fine. Where? Right, oh, starting with it. the S. Sorry. Got it. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Our organization works to improve the quality of life along the Milpas Corridor, so we participate in the Milpas Action Task Force to deal with neighborhood er issues arising in the operation of Casa Esperanza. We also have the Milpas Outreach Project, which assists chronically homeless individuals in leaving the street. We put on the Milpas Holiday Parade and several other activities in the area. Um, we too have spoken to a lot of neighbors, and our board did not vote to support this, and there is a tremendous amount of concern in the neighborhood. I would like to state for the record that in 2009, I met many of the people that would become the Milpas Community Association in fighting off five legally approved dispensaries in this neighborhood and two illegally operating dispensaries in this neighborhood. Um, we would like to also state for the record, we do not feel the Milpas Corridor should have ever been zoned for this use. And we are putting together a town hall meeting at Casa La Raza on February 18th to discuss that with our local and state 
elected officials as to why they saw fit to put this use in this neighborhood. For the reasons other neighbors have stated, too close to schools, too heavy of a traffic area, there is no parking in the industrial zones. Ask Marburg. You know, they're, they're chewing a lot of the parking in that area. And the pedestrian access in that area is not ideal. This has very little to do with Mr. Howe's operations. He actually uh, met with SBPD, and they recommended that he meet with us and discuss putting a neighborhood watch program in place. So we've had a conversation about that because we've put in two neighborhood watches in on the east side, one around Casa Esperanza and one in the lower east side. But we have not moved forward with any plans to do anything at this time. Um, however, we do agree, given that there was an armed robbery at that location in 2011 and a fire at that location in 2013, which police have suspected was arson, that a neighborhood watch is, is a good mitigating factor for that area. We would like to see one because we do have a lot of problems in that area we'd like to resolve. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you. So I don't have any more requests to speak. Um, I don't know if someone now decided they want to speak. If so, you can fill out a speaker slip. See no one. Like I said, um, I received a packet of letters and I did have time to review all of them. So I will close the public hearing. And actually, at this time, I would like to take a 10-minute break since the applicant submitted some more information regarding the parking study. And I would like staff to review one. And we can have one up here for the public if they want to um, look at the um, parking information. But I will recess till 5 after 11. Great, thank you. So I'll reconvene the meeting. Um, I had a chance to review the parking information. I don't know, staff, did you have anything you wanted to respond in regards to the parking information? Uh, Stacy Wilson, I could just describe it uh, if that's sure. helpful. Uh, so the plan that's presented is using on street parking. There are kind of two areas that are highlighted. One is for the um, members, or um, um, yeah, I'm going to say customer parking. Um, that is pr proposed to be on Milpa Street. Um, additionally, there would be additional parking for customers, um, would be overflow, but I think more so for the employees that goes into the industrial areas using Nep Nepal, um, Yananali, um, west of, May of Milpas and Mason Street west of Milpas. Um, in our experience, it's the employers who have more um, say over where the employees can park, but not as much as where the customers can park. Um, we have, I did uh, discuss with the applicants, the um, remind them of the bicycle parking that's on site. I think there's four spaces, is that correct? Is you that, can get four, four yeah. bikes on there four bicycle parking spaces as that relates to reducing the parking demand for vehicles um, that could be for visitors as well as employees. And then we did um, have some discussion about uh, transit opportunities in the area. There are definitely is a, a bus stop along Milpa Street and um, there might be some opportunities in that area as well. Has the city done parking studies in this area or parking counts or have an idea of what the parking is an impacted area? Do you know? Uh, I do not know. Um, we don't generally use that word impacted. We um, and um, our traffic engineering staff has not done an occupancy study. In fact, uh, we would one of the one of the considerations was to ask for a, a 15 minute zone on street. Um, that is not, um, has not been conducted. Um, in talking with uh, traffic engineering staff about that, they would want for the business to go in for a petition to be filed with the staff and so that they could see what the needs and the actual operation of the street or occupancy of the street is at that time 
in order to determine whether or not and and the turnover of that parking as to whether or not a 15 minute zone would be appropriate but but we do not have that information currently okay and then what about loading and unloading space in terms of you know the uh, i think it's a white curb how are those being would that be a similar situation that once the I believe that you're talking about passenger loadings yeah. on the white mm -hmm. curb. Um, in um, when I asked the question to traffic engineering at staff, they thought that the 15 minute <coughs> zone would be the uh, best um, a zone if they were to install a different type of zone. I, I believe that the thinking there was that that way. Um, um, the the driver could park their vehicle and get out in a passenger loading zone situation. The white zones, mm -hmm. uh, you cannot leave the vehicle unattended, even for a moment. Mm -hmm. And so, in that situation, it, you would the um, the member would always have to be a passenger and could not be a, a driver of the vehicle. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. In terms of how long on average does it take someone to be served? Five to ten minutes. And that's assuming they're already a member and done the, did the intake process and how? I guess that's something you didn't explain in your presentation in terms of the intake process um, when they come in the in the um, building. Sure. So the, <laughs> upon the initial visit, um, which obviously uh, is kind of the sign up process. Um, the, the, form, the forms themselves. Oh, you need to turn it on. Push the button. Push that button. Okay. Um, the, the initial sign up process, um, I don't see taking any longer than 10 minutes. Um, the, the form that you see um, in, the, in the packet um, will be automated, um, so, uh, and it will be on an iPad. So um, it, in terms of, 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 of reading the information and being able to check off the information, it'll be a, a pretty seamless and electronic process. Um, we we um, ha have elected to do, uh, to wait to do the, the, um, uh, the consultation until after the patient has been approved. Um, so we would be doing that in one of the offices, you know, inside. Um, of the store, so uh, those 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 uh, those would be by appointment only, and um, we would be scheduling you know more than a few of those in an hour. So um, uh, whether they're signing up, whether a patient is signing up or coming in to acquire medicine, we we don't envision that them being in, in, inside of the uh, the dispensary any longer than ten fifteen minutes maximum. Okay. And then, Stacy, in terms of, I understand the zoning requirements in terms of retail, and it's retail's retail regardless of what it is. But in terms of parking demand, um, part of their operation includes educational classes and yoga classes. Is the demand any different? For, is that just part of retail demand? Is that different? I'm just trying to understand the parking. Since they have no parking on site, what that component of the business does. Yeah, I, I, we didn't evaluate the parking demand um, yeah. because uh, really it's just, it, it is just a commercial mm -hmm. use. Okay. So, right. and if I could just. And it's a non conforming situation, which there right. is no parking there. So, another commercial use could go in, like perhaps a yoga studio or another retail establishment or a mix. And it's just this additional permit that, that, that requires that. Correct. Yeah, the whole non-conforming thing. I was just wondering if you happen to know in terms of demand, is, that, is the demand for that type of use different? So, okay, no, that's fine. Yeah. All right, so um, I do have some questions on the uh, operational plan. Um, I read it, and actually this is a lot better of an operational plan than the other ones I've seen. It's more comprehensive. Um, Thank you. But I, I still have questions. Um, so on page 10, it talks about uh, how <clears throat> you view that you are in <clears throat> compliance with criteria 8, mm -hmm. 
which talks about all reasonable measures have been incorporated into the dispensary security plan or consistently taken to successfully control patents, patrons' conduct resulting in disturbances, vandalism, crowd control inside or outside the premises, traffic control problems, marijuana use in public or creation of a public or private nuisance or interference of the operation of another business. So, you know, part of your response is about the zero tolerance clause that Mr. Bowen uh, said. But on the second paragraph there, it says, the site and security plan indicate Canopy will install 17 security cameras. The cameras will be placed throughout the building's interior and exterior and will be monitored during and after hours with the purpose of identifying disturbances, blah, blah, blah. So I understand during hours there's going to be management staff there and security guards. Who will, is going to be monitoring at after hours and where? Is, it, is there a remote feed or? Yeah, there is a remote feed. Um, and our, um, uh, our, our um, consultant uh, company, uh, Home Control Solutions, and Mission Security are both set up to monitor after hours. So does uh, it get fees. fed to them during hours too? I mean, is it a 24-hour feed? It is. Or is it only? Yes, it's a 24-hour feed, yes. Is it so to Mission and Home Security? Uh, home Control, yeah. Okay, and then on the next page, number 11, when it talks about consistency with criteria 9, which is similar idea that have no potentially adverse effects on the health, peace, safety of persons um, criteria. It talks about um, activities conducted on site other than dispensing medicine to qualified canopy members include one-on-one -on -one private consultation, which you've kind of explained, education courses and meditation yoga therapy. Um, the education courses you had said would be in the offices. What about the meditation yoga? Where? So, so the majority of that would take place off-site. Um, but for very small um, classes, we, we were thinking of doing it outside, be, behind the secured fence, um, kind of adjacent to the building. It, where, where the, um, yeah, mm -hmm. here, but, but behind the fence. The landscape plan showed this old asphalt to be removed and <coughs> called out for, well, we could refer to it. There's a plan sheet in here, but artificial turf. Right. So, in area. so you vision it off-site and here? I envision the larger classes off-site. Um, most of the classes will be off-site. Um, we we do uh, we would like to conduct a, a, a sm smaller classes uh, on-site if if allowed. And what when you buy smaller class, what do you mean? I mean either one-on-one -on -one type type of therapy or you know three to five members. So like meditation yoga, three to five members. Yeah. It gets any larger than that, then we would do it off-site. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then on the next page 12, where it talks about preventing a nuisance, um, aiding the neighborhood, not burdening it, preventing nuisance activities, and then it says working with law enforcement. Here it just generically says two full-time guards will be patrolling the area during business hours, but later on I saw you, you propose it once, at least once per hour. Then you have a sentence in here that says, a knowledgeable and trained management staff will also be on site during business hours. How does that help with working with law enforcement? What knowledgeable, what do you mean? <clears throat> well, w one of the things that, w that we've been talking about is um, is either, either, either hiring or... Um, Having our uh, our floor managers become uh, get a guard card, a security guard card, so that we have additional knowledge on site uh, to to deal with 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 any issues. Say, for example, one of the security guards is patrolling; uh, the other one is dealing with uh, an issue or um, a member in the in the waiting room, and um, a, a, th a third person. Uh, we we're contemplating having this guard card. Um, just, just, just there is kind of a backup, backup plan, if needed. 
so that management staff will have additional training above and beyond? Yes. Okay, so then on page 16, this is the, um, what was referred to in one of the <clears throat> public's comments, and I also had a question, too, regarding unique marketing concept. Right. It talks about um, Canopy Productions, how they bring world-class musicians and special performance to Santa Barbara, and it talks about a concert, concert staging area, street walk, lectures, and learning. Where, and then it does say on the next page about um, you'll launch your festival, festival with some organizations like the Avon Walk for Breast Cancer, AIDS Walk, and such have you. Can you explain this a little more? You're not proposing these types of things at your site, are no. you? No, 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 no. This, this, is, a, this is a completely... Um, uh, so, so, so this, this organization is, is, has come to Santa Barbara because I've come to Santa Barbara, and this is what I used to do. 20 years of this in my experience in doing high-profile concerts and, and entertainment-type type work. Um, w w one of the things that, uh, that we uh, have uh, agreed to do is uh, to implement a... Uh, is, is to implement a, a rather um, lengthy and um, detailed uh, community service uh, program. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that we would like to do within the community is these types of events, which would be held at a place, for example, like the Santa Barbara Bowl. So it would obviously be separate permitting, you know, a, separate, a whole separate process that does not have anything to do with 118 North Milpas okay. um, would be used to, to roll out events such as this and benefit the community. That was my reading of it, but I just wanted to make sure that sure. you weren't proposing to have this be like the the hub of all this or the. Um, no, no, just I, I I would just be working out of the office and kind of coordinate coordinating act, you know coordinating activities mm -hmm. business activities out of the office, but um, no, all all of this type of event and and things would be <coughs> be uh, done outside. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Oh, and then I did have uh, um, <clears throat> your hours of operation. The ordinance allows eight to six. Oh, okay. And on and um, here you say nine a.m. to six p.m. And there's somewhere else reference to eight to seven or something. What are your hours? Um, I was with the understanding that the ordinance said nine to six, but if it's eight to six, then it would be eight to six. So it's going to be per ordinance requirements. Yes. Okay, on page 20, right, this is where you get into the responses to the particular uh, operation requirements, and it's um, in response to dispensing to new patients. And this is the only place I see this statement. And it says, all documents will be verified prior to allowing access to the proposed dispensing area and only after the 24-hour waiting period, as is the protocol. Well, the ordinance requires that they can't get medicine the first 24 hours in this waiting period. Um, and I don't see that explained anywhere else about that 24-hour waiting period. Do you, is that part of your proposal? or I don't know. It says, as is the protocol. What's that mean? Uh, probably should, as is written in the ordinance. It's probably what it should say. But it's the um, what, I, what I've really tried to do here is just to, to point out that I'm following the ordinance guideline, which, which means there's a 24-hour waiting period before anybody or any member can, can come in and acquire medicine. Mm -hmm. I guess that's maybe I didn't write it well enough there okay. or what, not clear enough. Um, and then on the next page, um, again, it's referring to compliance with sections D1 through 8, and on the third line, it says, or second line starts, the rules of conduct, specifically including the points on the attachments, will be spelled out in a large sign located in the main wall of the front building or front waiting room. What, which attachment? Because attachments here have to do with the management. Driver, here's a driver's license and um, director's stuff. I don't, 
I don't, it says including points on the attachments. Um, where, where is that here? Right here. Okay. I don't know what points. I'll go back and read this. It's been a while. You're asking where it is, someplace in here. Yeah. Well, no, they, she, she talks she, about some form. The rules of conduct right. uh, is, will be spelled out in a large sign, and it says specifically including the points on the attachments. But so what? I don't. I was trying to find what this what points were called out on this attachment that were going to be right. on and that I, sign. And I think I miswrote that. And I think what I meant to say was because there is an area signage area in the. And I think I meant to reference the signage area. I may have initially, uh, yeah, that's what it was. I had initially thought that I would include the signage requirements on an attachment, and I didn't. I actually wrote a separate signage section. So the way that this should read is uh, specifically including the points in the, in the signage section of the document. So where is that in here? Yeah, that's on the page. Signage is on... Uh, after 20, so. Okay. Um. Okay, it's, <laughs> I'm looking in the signage section and it's not it just says there. it's going to comply with our sign right. ordinance. Um, but I know that there is a section in here that does talk about the signs. Um, well, talk, I found there's like four signs. One behind the receptionist with rules of conduct. Uh, one somewhere, state law warning. One regarding the minor pro prohibition without parent or guardian and then the hours of operation. But I didn't see anything that actually says what. Yeah, and I, and I, and I, I don't know. I think I, I had a, I, I might have had a, I had a section in an earlier draft and that dealt with a bulleted list of, of sign requirements and I may have just incorporated that bulleted list into the, to the body okay. and various points in the body, which I think you've just found, those four areas. All the different signs, but yeah, I didn't see specifically, it just says what the code of conduct, okay, all right. Okay, so then on the next page, 22, where it talks about dispensing operations in the management f or member flow. Yes. Um, the last two sentences um, says, Canopy will limit cannabis offerings to one cannabis-related transaction per member in a 24-hour period and not to exceed two ounces of cannabis. Um, how do you, since there is another... Uh, facility approved on Upper State Street and we can have up to three in the city, how do you guarantee that they're not members somewhere else? Because they need to keep their original recommendations. So if they're coming <clears> and showing you and then they're going up to State Street and going to show them and then they're going to wherever else and showing it to them, how do you make sure that doesn't happen? Joe, you want to help me with this one? Sure. The fact is you can ask people and we we do ask people to commit to not doing that, but just as people occasionally commit prescription fraud at pharmacies, uh, there, there is no practical way to guarantee that somebody will not do that. Okay. Can't be done. So it's not, and I didn't, when I looked at the <clears throat> patient agreement form, Exhibit F, I didn't see any acknowledgement that you're requesting any acknowledgement from the patient that they won't do that. We will incorporate that request into the patient form. Okay. Because there's no like registry or anything that you can check in terms of no. cards and stuff. Yeah. Okay. 
Just as CVS doesn't know if you made a copy of your prescription for painkillers and filled it a second time at Rite Aid. Okay. It's okay. against the law, okay. but people do it. Okay, thank you. Um, Here's one of the signs, page 24, where it talks about state law, st state law compliance warning, just says posted in a con conspicuous location inside the collective. Um, it should say canopy will post and where it is. But here up above, um, where it says canopy product offerings, canopy will provide a range of quality tested products to its member, including but not limited to multiple cannabis strains, and it goes on to list some things. Um, Depending on what the outcome is, I don't know what it is, but you w you do need to com have a complete list of what you're what you're offering because it is um, a requirement of the ordinance that the staff hearing officer approve the list of products. So, um, when it says not limited to, you you do need to be specific. Okay, wh which page is it on? That's still twenty four. Oh, yeah, right. So, but not limimited to here. Yeah, take and that, and we could just stripe, but not limited yeah. to. Um, yeah, that's 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 all we'll carry. Okay, and then on page thirty-one, um, you this is where you talk about uh, security guards, and this is actually the start of your security plan. And it talks about um, that you're going to have two guards on premise through the 24 hours. Um, and, it, and it says what the duties will be is one is to um, uh, will be one will be the lead and has a station with a drop safe located in the reception area. And then the other one sounds like it'll be more of a uh, roving guard. But it says throughout the day, the sentry guard may escort employees to handle collective business. So if you have two on, um, on premises at all times, so would a third one come in? Or at that time, there'd only be one that would be just monitoring the inside? How does it? Well, the, the, the guard would actually escort the employee um, to the car and then would, would not leave essentially the, the block. Okay, so it's not like for cash deposits or what? Yeah, so the, the idea would be that the, the guard would escort the, um, the employee or the, 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 the member to the, to, the, to the car, and then they would obviously leave the premises, but the guard would stay there. So yeah, because this says, throughout the day, the sentry guard may escort employees to handle collective business. Right. So that makes it sound like to me that they'd be going off-site. Yeah, and it, it, didn't, it wasn't meant to say that. Just, it meant just to their escort them to their car, make sure that they're safe while they're driving away. It's worth pointing out, too, as far as cash is concerned or deposits, our bank is across the street. Okay. I was just asking what sure. when it means collective business. So if one's leaving, that leaves one on site. But right. you're saying it's not going to leave the pre premise, which is within 200 feet of the Correct. property. Correct. Okay. All right, so on page 37, um, and this is, again, with the security plan, and it's response to E7 through 10, and it says, public nuisance. The canopy operating plan provides for the management members of the collective to take all reasonable steps to discourage and correct objectable conditions that constitute a public or private nuisance in parking areas, sidewalks, alleys, and areas surrounding the premises, and that's just uh, what the ordinance says. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by reasonable steps? I know there's a, some things discussed in other areas, but what do you mean by this statement? Well, I, I think as, as security guards uh, monitor, um, I think um, just their, their presence is a deterrent, obviously. Um, and then uh, we... Uh, plan on you know having a direct or security patrol ha has it ha plans on having a direct access to the police department, um, so that if any if if anything that they monitor or that they see is going on illegally, that they would obviously you know notify the police immediately. 
So by direct report, meaning they'll just dial 911? Yeah, 911 or uh, potentially a, a number set up by the police department that they would like us to call directly. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then um, regarding the trash, can you explain the, what your visions are? Because it says the tra trash receptacle used by the dispensary <laughs> shall be locked and screened from views from view at all times. Yeah. Because um, the plan show wood screens, so uh, do you mean locked because it's behind a fence, not in terms of an actual enclosure? Because the picture that you show in here, it shows an enclosure. Closure. Right. So I was trying to... No, I, I wasn't, I was thinking that... The the locked would mean because it's behind the, fen the fence and the locked fence. Mm -hmm. So um, I, w we could lock the trash enclosure. Uh, probably wouldn't be much of a problem. Yeah, um, we had thought this being a gate, locked gate, that mm -hmm. uh, Marburg would uh, come up and access or your people would pull it to this location and then they'd pull it out. No, they, the they wanted the Marburg to, to have a key come in. and come in and grab it. All right. yeah. Yeah. So that's our locked point, if you would like. It wouldn't be difficult to lock that as well, or lock the trash. Can I don't think it's not a full enclosure, is it? There's a no, this is a pad and then a screen. Pad and a wood yeah. screen. Yeah, okay. just more more for visibility here, because this is a transparent tent. Mm -hmm. You can see that we didn't want to see that. In there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, what kind of stuff goes in the trash? Um, well, we, we won't be putting any any cannabis in the trash. So just, you know normal things that, that you'd put in a trash in a business. Um, you paper, know, paper, office stuff. office stuff, yeah. Yep. Is any cannabis ever thrown away? Does it go bad that you have to, or you go through the product so much? It... Yeah, I've never had an experience where we had to throw the product away. Okay. <clears throat> okay, those are my questions on the operating plan. Okay, so... Um, Okay, so you explained what the fence, if, what the fence area is for. If um, there was some condition placed on that no yoga, um, you know, no off-site classes be held on the property, what would this area be used for? What is it? And you said a lot of the classes are going to be offered off-site. So what do you envision? I know it's just a dead space. So, yeah. But what are your plans for this area? I mean, honestly, just a garden. Um, and then, you know, a garden for, for employees to, and members just to, to, you know, meditate in or, uh, you know, socialize in, really. I mean, it's, it's, it's not really a space where, you know, we can obviously, you know, use as, as, as part of the dispensary because it's outside. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'm just trying to find a practical use for it because we can't use it for parking um, to, to beautify the area, to complement the neighborhood um, and then to it's it's really more of a, an employer membership lounge to be honest with you where very few members and yeah, employees would be congregating at one time mm -hmm. okay and then can you explain um, I think that already the entrance area this is your main entrance and this yeah. is if someone needs a ramp but what about the exit doors and how to get into the garden area? Well, so um, the, the two exit doors along the side of the building are exit only doors. Okay, so we, we don't envision using these doors at all. Uh, the only reason maybe is to take out the trash. And then you'd come back in here? Or would you go in back? Um, yeah, we'd probably come back out around in here because these are locked at all. These exit doors are locked at all times. Okay. Um, the access through into this area, for, for example, um, an employer, a member, um, can be done through through this locked gate, and the security guard would, and obviously they would come in here, they would check in and would make sure that they're a member, um, uh, and then and and if there were any activity, they would go out around here and come back through the fence, which would have a security guard at it, uh, and they'd be allowed in through here. But we we wouldn't want anybody using the exit doors. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then what do you envision in here? Um, it says computer workstations, accessible workstations. What do you envision that for? Uh, that's for the sign-up process. The the um, what what I was. Oh, the iPads. Yeah, yeah. 
So that's mainly for the sign-up process. Um, and then we will um, have some educational material uh, in, in both hard copy as well as uh, electronic version form. So um, uh, members would be able to uh, research, you know, various uh, health uh, uh, and wellness, you know, type type activities and, and treatments, um, you know, on on the computers if if they wanted to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Mr. Erdner, are you going to revisit any transportation issues? Yeah. Okay. I can right now. Um, yeah, the parking is a big issue for me, and as I'm sure you are following the dispensary on De La Vina, how they were providing four parking spaces at the rear of the site, um, and and then on street parking and just the location of the, the parking lot and the access to it and how to how to um, reduce the potential for nuisance uh, in the in the area. Um, so I'm still struggling with parking in this situation in that I understand non-conforming status. I understand it's an existing situation. It's an existing building that has no parking. It's allowed to change its use and still have no parking unless it adds more than 50% of the floor area. Then it needs to bring its parking up to code. So I understand this. This is a different type of business than a typical retail operation. Um, and so although it does meet the zoning um, it, it meets the zoning requirement and that it's non-conforming, we're not going to require any more, I still have that um, concern. And then also, again, with loading and unloading, like delivery of products, how that's going to occur. If there's no parking in front of the business, how, how, do, you, um, how do you propose to deliver the product? Maybe I could address those. <coughs> One of the one of the things you have to keep in mind is that although ordinary businesses don't have any control over where their customers park, because of course they don't want to give the customer an incentive to go to some other business that isn't as nosy and controlling, this particular facility, because it's a members only facility, has a great deal of leverage over where the members park. So, uh, while it's, while it's true that we, there isn't any practical way for us to go through the neighborhood and identify the cars of members, we can bring pressure on members to use the parking plan and if they can't park in front, to put their car west of Milpa Street over in the more industrial area because the members share our interest in not creating problems for the neighbors. Problems for the neighbors could lead to the dispensary not being able to operate, which then completely deprives the members of their access to medicine at this dispensary. So we have a kind of leverage in the parking situation that no other business has. But that was one of my concerns on the De La Vina pro um, project in that you have your medicine, now you're walking a great distance with your medicine, which is, could be an attractive nuisance. Well, I don't know. All I can say to that is that when Milpa Street had, I can think of at least four dispensaries operating uh, and operating at longer hours than, than are contained in the present ordinance. This was four, five, six years ago. I know of no documented case of an on-street assault of somebody coming or going from a dispensary in order to steal their medicine. That just didn't happen. Well, the one that I know of on the corner of Milpis and I think it was Cannon Perdido, they had parking. They had two behind the building and they had a parking lot behind it. Yeah. And they had the door. A couple of them did couple of them didn't. My, my point is, wherever it is that people were parking four and five years ago, those four dispensaries had a very considerable list of patients. And the records of the police department just don't show that people were getting attacked okay, yeah, after leaving the dispensary. I don't have that documentation in front of me. Okay, great. Right. So, uh, so then, Stacy, I know I asked you this before. Um, 
regarding the availability of on-site parking or on-street parking, and you said we don't have any occupancy counts. Um, has there been any recent projects in the area that might have information, or we just don't have that information? We don't have that information. Okay. All right, great, thank you. Um, all right, and that's all the transportation if you needed to go for a meeting. Um, okay. Um, Like I said, my main, this, uh, this operation plan is actually is, uh, is well thought out. And I, I think it's good. I had questions and there are some things that need to be clarified. Um, it's not really the operation plan that I have concerns with. It, it is the parking um, and the lack of parking. And um, this area, it, it's one of the areas that council identified as being um, an appropriate area for dispensaries and they took a lot of things into consideration. The original ordinance actually had distance requirements from schools um, and that was taken out with the update of the ordinance and then they specified these specific areas. So in terms of the area, um, I know there is concerns with children and residences, residents in the neighborhood. But again, it's, it's you know, council's direction that this, this is one of those areas. So then I look at the site specific improvements and um, uh, whether the site itself is an appropriate location for the dispensary. And um, so explain to me again, what is the role of your, your security guards? Is just to patrol and just to monitor access or are they going to provide escort services too if necessary? Yes, they are. Yes. Yeah, and that, I, I, had, I had mentioned that in the supplemental right. uh, plan. So, yeah, absolutely. Any, uh, any elderly, handicapped, um, or person requesting assistance um, will have it, um, either with the security guards, which there should be one available, uh, if not management, myself, or, or one of my floor managers uh, will do it. But, but absolutely, yes. Okay. Um, I'll have to think about this some more. Okay, so then in regards to um, the conditions of approval, you've looked at those? You've read those? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, I have. Can you respond one more time? regarding this, the removal of the curb cut. Um, 10, it's about 15, well, it's more than 15. Um, I know staff couldn't require it, but this is part of a discretionary application in which I would have authority to require it. Um, can you, and, and by the removal of the curb cut and replacement with curb and gutter, that would increase on street parking in this area. So I don't know. I, I'm, will, I'm willing to do it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I haven't had a chance to study it. Tony and I looked at it briefly. Um, it's possible that we could. Originally, it sounded like when, when Ryan went out there to meet with somebody at Public Works, it sounded like the ramp would get messed up down in the end here where we have to have a fairly flat 2% landing. Mm -hmm. But looking at it, it looks like we could, you know, curb that curb and gutter it, and whether this is planter or sidewalk, uh, I, I think it's possible we could make yeah. that work without without affecting this. If we have to get into changing this ramp and its position, then uh, it's much more difficult. So, uh, so you know, looking at the photos, uh, I think we could we could certainly uh, make an attempt. Yeah, I mean, that. if I think what it comes down to, at least for me, is cost. So if it's $1,500 or $2,000, I have no problem with that. The, the when the uh, the transportation planner came out, he was throwing around like numbers like ten thousand, twelve thousand because of the landing had to be moved, the ADA ramp had to be changed, uh, but but 
with you know I don't have a problem doing it. In fact, I would prefer to do it because it would add the extra parking parking space. Now this is indicated as the property line, right? Correct. Do yeah. you know where the edge of the right of way is? Is it at the this? Street I believe line, that I is correct. Yeah, I believe that's the right of way there. Yeah, <clears throat> back of the uh, sidewalk edge there. Yeah, and we discussed whether or not pedestrian master plan improvements are required because, mm -hmm. as you know, as occurs all along Milpas, it's very tight between where you have these big trees. Mm -hmm. But yeah. uh, transportation in our DART review said they they were fine leaving the back of the sidewalk as is here. That's actually something else I could ask Stacy, but maybe you know. Um, it, it's true in this neighborhood in Upper State Street too. These trees they like to go yeah. underneath the sidewalk and. Yeah, correct havoc up, yeah, has, yeah has in the dart review this looks pretty straight um, but I don't know behind the tree it was that discussed in terms of it says you have to replace remove and replace damaged public improvements but was there any discussion of fixing the sidewalk in front of that there was yeah. there was oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah we budgeted for it okay. okay is so, it pulling up right there I mean it looks it is, fairly it, flat it, it's right pretty there, flat right? um, through here um, and, and most of the sidewalk is good. Um, just a little bit toward the curb, you don't see it here because the tree is kind of blocking it. But um, there, there is the, some areas where the sidewalk has risen, and we, w we will be repairing that. This one, yeah. I printed that just from Google. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if that it's, has it's right up. over here. It's kind of in this, this area right here. Okay. To the, I guess, left. So it's between the, the sidewalk and the curb that it's pulling it up, probably right. Yeah. In. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's kind of like where you would step out of your car. Mm -hmm. So the improvements would include not only that curb and gutter, but the repair to that. Yeah. The, well. and, and that's all. The repairs on the sidewalk are already in the budget. We're already going to do that. Because we're, we're already taking out the concrete in front. So it would be an easy thing for us to do to, to flatten any. Anything that needs to be flat. What he's saying is part of the proposal is to remove the uh, concrete that sits in front here and actually green it up with some planter. Yeah. And that was part of what we talked about at design review. And okay. Approved it. So. Okay. Well. Um, Getting back to the, the um, criteria. Um, I don't need to read through them all again. Um, Tony did that, but um, you know the first four regarding um, the operation of the dispensary, uh, you stated in your um, packet that you will operate in compliance with state and local laws. Um, it's, this area hasn't been identified as an area of increased high crime, of an increased area or high crime activity. You haven't operated any other dispensaries in the neighborhood. Um, it's not a huge site. Uh, the location's not prohibited. So then it would get down to seven, eight, nine, seven, eight, nine, and that's where it gets into the site plan, the floor plan, the hours of operation security plan. I think your security plan. I don't have expertise in that. I'd have to rely on mission and home, home security, home control solutions. Home yeah. control <laughs> solutions. I know I missed that one up. Rely on them with their expertise in terms of what's adequate with the security cameras and lighting. Um, I have noticed that. Uh, the the windows, I don't think up here, but some of the, the windows and um, doors and stuff are, are bulletproof. So there is enhanced features on here to um, help reduce the potential for crime. Um, I know that was a concern expressed regarding a, a robbery that had occurred earlier on the site and that there's bars on the window. Yeah. Um, well, that, those are around this perimeter, mm -hmm. not... The, the door, does the front door have something special or was this, this just this door? Was this, this is, since this is the, the just the waiting area. The common um, area. Is common the common area, area. Uh -huh. right. We, we didn't feel that this needed to be secured. Okay. Um, however, 
any activity that happens beyond this wall all right. um, and has to do with cannabis, this is all secured. So the entry door I was talking about would have been this one yes, here? Yes, exactly. Oh, yeah, bullet resistant. Okay. Now, now, these windows, just to note, currently we're not showing, but they, they have bars on them, not bulletproof. This one's bulletproof. Mm -hmm. Uh, I believe that one's full of fruit. Well, and this gate here will keep people and from getting in. And that gate keeps people from getting in. So these have bars currently, but not full of fruit there. But again, okay. the gate keeps them from getting in. So with regards to the parking, um, it is, an, like I said, it's an existing situation, um, and you actually are improving the situation by the requirement of removing the curb cut and replacing it with city standard curb, um, curb gutter and sidewalk. Uh, you are increasing the parking in that area, and you are providing um, security so I could find this, the project consistent with the um, criteria. However, I would want to add more conditions than what I just talked about, the curb gutter and sidewalk. Um, okay. There is a provision in the code that allows for, uh, or doesn't allow for, it states that um, the annual review of collective dispensary operations put a condition on there that requires one year after the final certificate, sorry, the certificate of occupancy that uh, the applicant submits for a, um, an annual review in compliance with this ordinance. And, um, and then annually thereafter, uh, I would add that condition. And then what that would be, it would check, you know, per the, per the ordinance, um, the, um, under is number H about the cultivation records, the membership records, the financial records, um, and then also uh, it would review the security or review the oper the management operations in terms of that confirming that they still haven't been convicted of any felonies or crimes, um, and so it, it's just what the, the ordinance says here. In regards to the um, operational plan, you would need to submit a full list. You said just take out including but not limited to on that one page, but include the full list of what you're proposing to um, sell. And that includes, I think you were mentioning at some time in a later date, you might sell apparel Correct. or clothing line or something. Yeah. So um, just include everything that you plan on selling there. Okay. And then... Um, you did clarify this, but I would like it. You did clarify it to me in the hearing, but clarified also in regards to the operation plan, where the minimum of two security guards shall be on the premises at any one time during the entirety of the dispensary's open hours. And that would include providing the minimum coverage during scheduled work breaks. So like the lunch hour, someone else needs to come in and, and be there. And when the security guard escorts an employee to handle collective business, since it's set in there, so if they have to escort them somewhere off site, you need to right. have a minimum of two on the premises, which is the 200 feet. It's not right in the building, but within the 200 feet for the ordinance. Okay. And then also to acknowledge that 24 hour new patient waiting period that um, the ordinance requires, that that needs to be acknowledged in here. Um, I, I think I did acknowledge it in here. Just well, it just says per, per it is in here as well. So well, it should be all in here. Okay. If this is your plan. Yeah, I just did a supplemental, but I'd be happy to put this it. This says in. the 24-hour in here. That's the little thing you gave me today. Okay. I think it does. Yeah, I think I've got um, canopy is also installing a state of burglary plan to operate 24 hours a day. Well, it just says a successful 24-hour waiting period. It doesn't really say what it okay. is. So, yeah, I'll be happy to include that in the... I, I lived for 24 hours, therefore I was successful. <laughs> I didn't to say what it was. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah all right. Okay, yeah, so you want me to include that in the... In the yeah, that needs to be, and that could be on okay. the... And then um, that patient agreement form that you have on Exhibit F, 
it needs to be revised to include that the um, patient understands or agrees that they are limited by city ordinance to only belong to one collective or co-op. That way they acknowledge it there and you're right, you can't, but at least they're acknowledging it and it's found out you're gone. Um, and then also um, there's a statement in your packet that talks tolerance. about the zero tolerance. Okay. So, and that's zero tolerance use policy including um, during any educational class or classes that are offered on site. You know, you said that the majority of them are going to be off site, but anytime they're on the premise, premise whether it's meditating, they need to meditate without their medicine then. <laughs> right, they okay. They need to do it freestyle. And then I already talked about the curb cut replaced with city standard curb cutter and sidewalk. And then you had um, discussed in the hearing when I was asking you the use of this wellness center. Um, I want access to this area through this gate controlled. It's only, I understand you need to get out here through for trash, but if someone's coming in here and using this area, they need to be checked and come in and out. You have other ways that they can come out through sure. this area that yeah. this is not to be used as entrance and exit for the, the patients. Okay. Or the clients or whatever you well, no, we have to have for fire exit only. That, that's that. fine, yeah, but just not, it's not an active, yeah. yeah, it's not an active coming and going type thing. Um, that all so, that needs to come through the main okay. dispensing room. So if they, if they were to come in here and use one of these exit doors to go out here, then you'd want them to obviously exit though through here, correct? Or would you, would oh, you they want would them? have to, huh? Yeah, yeah. The, the, we wouldn't want them coming back through here, right? Yeah, that's okay. Okay. Because they've already been checked. And, um, yeah, right. so no, it's just not to be used as an entrance. Okay, that's fine. Um, we discussed when we were talking about the trash arrangement and how to handle that and screen it. We discussed, well, as I understood it, Marburg would be given access to enter here to get the trash cans and bring them out to their truck. Do you prefer that they pass through here? How would you? I would prefer that the management company move the garbage up outside of that secure area. We were looking at the requirement that it be screened, more like an ABR type thing, that the trashing that it should be enclosed and screened from view. That's fine for them to be stored there, but I know like in a residential setting how you have to carry your hands out to the curb. I know you can't do the curb, but if... Um, you would just watch for Most of the neighbors do that now. Most of the neighbors carry their trash out to the curb on trash day on Milpas. Okay. I think a previous iteration of the site plan showed that, and Karen Gumtow didn't think that was okay. They were proposing to put the trash cans out here for pickup. Um, if you know when they're coming, I guess you can wheel them out, but that's the issue is they've got their own schedule. So if you, you know see what, them we, show you know what up, day they they're coming, come. you know what morning they're coming. Yeah. You could right. then pull your cans out because of here for them, and then they could. Yeah, because at my house, I wheel them out on the curb, and they, and then I wheel. It them might back. be different in a commercial zone. Yeah, maybe. Um, well, then I can put a condition that says um, something to the fact. I, I like that they're stored in the back, so I don't want the storage to change. But um, if um, it's the access of Marburg has at this point. Yeah, I point. don't want them yeah, want in that area. This is the whole idea is to have this <clears throat> secured and yeah. limit who goes in there and have them actually check that they right. they have appropriate business to be on Could site. Marburg come in and say, hey, we're here for the trash? No, I rather, goes, uh, I'd yeah. rather them do this than come in through there. Um, well, I can put a condition that if um, if approved by, uh, what's the name? Yeah, 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 yeah uh, but what are uh, environmental services. Yeah, that uh, management shall put the trash at the curb rather than marble. That's uh, fine. So that, it, yeah. okay. Good. So Tony will just let us know, I guess, if she needs to, if we can use that flat area there to set them. It might be enough just to get them outside the fence and put them back here somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if they're willing to walk all the way back, wouldn't they be willing to walk somewhere here to get them? Sure. That's something you could work on the plan check, but yeah. I would, um, that's, I don't really want Mark or someone else who doesn't have a legitimate purpose 
I mean, that's legitimate, but not for mm -hmm. the purposes of this to be. Me neither, so we're on the same page. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then also, can you amend the, um, amend, amend the management plan on page 10 to um, explain this monitored during after hours, how you explain that there's a remote feed yep. to the security And also to be clear on page 16 that these, that the unique marketing concept, that that's not, that off -site. activity doesn't happen on site. Yep. Um, and then on page 21, where you points, specifically including the points on the attachment. Yeah, I'll amend that. Um, Either in this area, say what those points are, or point in the document if you read it and say, "Oh no, this I couldn't find it in the hearing. This is where it is," because um, it sounds like you have something specifically. The rules of contact, my understanding or conduct, is um, some of these that are outlined in the patient agreement form, um, and then also that you not smoking within or using your medicine within 200 feet. Right. Um, of all those ordinance requirements, that's what my understanding is, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, that's on the patient agreement form, the not medicating. Yeah. Medicating. So when that's what I think those sign. Right. What you mean by the sign, or that's not what I think. I know I read somewhere in here that it does specify, um, but I think it was more in a paragraph form versus, like you said, a, a bullet form. Yeah. yeah. You want me to bullet it? Um, that would probably be good. Okay. Just so it's clear. Yeah. Um, so I anticipated reviewing a, a proposal for the sign. Um, I don't know if you want to, if um, you think that's okay. Or yeah, well, maybe it needs to we be. You can a put a condition, condition that's not, but, community development staff. That's, that's with your requirements under the section uh, requirements, prior additions of permit, permit issuance that this community development staff will review your proposed. Interior signage. Okay. The exterior signage is required by the sign committee, so. Um, right. So you could show me what it's going to look like before you actually have it made. Sure. You know. Yeah, no problem. <clears throat> and then I already said the complete list, what I asked you about. And then on page 24, um, I know your intent, but if you can just, this, this says, State, as regarding another sign, state law compliance warning posted in a conspicuous location inside the storefront. Say that you canopy will post. Which, I'm sorry, which, which page? Page 24. Are you right, canopy will post. Got it. Yeah. I'm not going to require it, but you, because I have a condition on page 31 where I questioned you regarding the sentry guard may escort employees to handle collective business. Um, I have that condition that if if they were to leave site, you have to have two on board. Right. So if that is your intent to have them, if there's some reason why they need to be escorted for the business, right. as long as you keep two on site. So I don't, if you want to change that, you can, but I'm not going to require that. I know we discussed in the hearing, I don't know if you took notes on it or not. I did. Okay. And then I told you about the two things. Okay, so with those added conditions, um, I can find that the um, dispensary does meet the requirements of the ordinance um, and approve your request for the um, 
storefront collective dispensary permit at 118 North Memphis Street. My action is appealable to the Planning Commission within 10 calendar days, and that appeal is filed here at 630 Garden Street versus up at City Hall. I don't know if anyone's interested or not, but I wanted to let you know all the other discretionary um, review bodies, actions are appealable at City Hall, so I don't want you to run around to find out where to file appeal. Also, my action is appeal, um, the, the Planning Commission reviews all my actions, and if they felt this warranted additional discussion before them, they could call this item up and a hearing would be scheduled before the Planning Commission. And again, that's the same 10-day um, period as the appeal period. And if either of those would occur, um, Tony would contact you. Um, or if a member of the public's interested in knowing, they could contact Tony also to find out. Okay? So I adjourn the meeting. Thank you.